those that are watching right now, I'm, uh, I've got some tardy grades under the microscope. And this one is uh, going for a swim in a drop of water. Is this some, so something we drink? <laughs> Maybe sometimes. <laughs> oh my! Yeah, they may be. He may be trying to come out of his shell. You know, I mean, some people need to come out of their shells too. But, and we do that here at the Global Star Party. <laughs> it doesn't look like there's much to eat there, though. Like the other night. Uh, oh yeah, he was. They were gobbling the other night. These, this next series of uh, uh, images, I, I like to show art. This is, um, uh, I had communicated with um, a lady, uh, she is a, um, she is a technical or uh, scientific illustrator. Her name's Eleanor Lutz. Um, and uh, this, uh, this particular map that she did of the night sky illustrates uh, uh, 30 different civilizations and their uh, animals and mythology or people, different objects imagined in the sky. And it's, um, it's interesting how a lot of them repeat, you know, like the, uh, like Ursa Major, for example. And then this one, and then she did a series of planets and this one is the map of Mercury. I think it's just beautiful. And she has a whole series of these. She regrets not being able to come on to the show herself, um, but uh, she had other commitments. And then this one right here, this, this one's really cool. This is an orbit map of the solar system showing you know 18,000 asteroids, um, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, all the details are there. When you go on her website, she actually gives, you can download the data to try to recreate this yourself. So that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. But uh, we're get, getting officially started here for the uh, Global Star Party. This is our seventh one. We'll do another one on Friday that will run through Europe and uh, perhaps all the way down to Australia. So, um, and we'll make announcements about that later, but we're getting, we're getting started. Well, here we are. Um, uh, I wanted to thank everybody for getting started with us on the Global Star Party 7. Uh, we have, uh, as usual, um, people watching from around the world, and uh, we hope that uh, this somehow gives you the opportunity to meet people that you haven't met before, to hear the stories from the various astronomers that are joining us tonight, uh, and to, um, you know, with uh, your live chat uh, to, uh, you know, uh, give us uh, questions or comments as we go along. So, um, but as usual, we're going to get started with uh, David Levy. Uh, as you all know, uh, if you've been watching and following uh, this, the Global Star Parties, you know that uh, David is a dear friend of mine and a dear friend of many of the people here that are on our program tonight. He has touched so many lives. It's it's really hard to imagine the effect that David Levy has had on people over this last 50 or so years. That uh, that uh, one of one of the people that are on today was recounting a story how he met David 50 years ago. So you know, just a huge uh, uh, influence. Uh, a very kind uh, person. If you ever got a chance to meet him. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, when I think of David Levy, I just think of inspiration and, and star-filled nights. So, um, so David, I'm going to put the uh, stage on you. Well, thank you, Scott, Scotty. And uh, this is now our seventh global star party, and it's become quite a tradition. I'm getting to see a lot of old friends, friends that I haven't seen in quite some time, and some new friends that I'm actually enjoying meeting very well and friends that you will all get to see later on this evening. Um, in particular, Libby, Libby in the stars is uh, only 10 years old, but her generation is going to be leading us into the future. What telescope should you get? And I'm going to give you a very simple answer to that. And that is, you don't need a telescope at all. And most of you know that I enjoy more than anything else searching for comet searching for comets. But that's not really true. That's my second most enjoyable thing under the sky. But the single thing I enjoy more than anything else is watching for meteors, shooting stars. Because you don't need a telescope. You don't need anything but a comfortable chair a lawn chair to sit up, look up at the night sky and see what there is. And uh, if you go through centuries past, you get to see so much in the sense of uh, what other people saw under the night sky. And most of the literature that I've studied over the years was written before the telescope was even made. So really all they could see was were meteors. That was the most important thing they could see. We go all the way back to uh, Cervantes and Don Quixote. With this, the night darkened and lights and more lights began to flit about the wood, much as the gaseous exhalations of the earth flit about the sky and look to us like shooting stars. We go to uh, John Milton, who starts in the first couple of lines of Paradise Lost, him the almighty power hurled headlong flaming from the ethereal sky. And later on, the imperial ensign whose full high advanced shone like a meteor streaming to the wind with gems and golden luster, rich and blazed, seraphic arms and trophies shone like a meteor streaming to the wind. One of the things that I first saw when I was a little kid, about six years old, even younger than Libby is now, looking up at the night sky, was a shooting star. And it reminded me of Perry and Como that had a very popular, he had a very popular song at the time. Catch a falling star and put it in your pocket. Save it for a rainy day. Uh, I never got to meet Perry Como, although my mother did. I know she met him at a grocery store in Florida one day. And that must have been a really exciting thing to do. I wish I'd had a chance to meet him and I would have had a chance to ask him if he had actually managed to catch a falling star at some point. And then one of the most intelligent presidents we've ever had in the United States, Thomas Jefferson, who was wrong about meteors, where he claimed I would more easily believe that two Yankee professors would lie than that stones would fall from heaven. But I think my favorite when I look up at the sky and think about meteors, is John Donne. Go and catch a falling star. Get with child a mandrake root. Tell me where all past years are, or who cleft the devil's foot. Teach me to hear mermaids singing, or to keep off envy's singing, and find what wind serves to advance an honest mind. And tonight, we have a sky so fine that we all can enjoy the stars online. Thank you very much. Oh, that was wonderful, David. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, well, our our next uh, um, in our next segment here, we have uh, J. Kelly Beatty, uh, the uh, the beaming, uh, uh, smiling face of Sky and Telescope magazine, and. Um, I think that uh, anyone that's met Kelly before, I mean, you just, uh, you get, um, I don't know, I just get a great 
uh, feel from, from this guy because he is uh, someone that is always enthusiastic. He's always inspiring uh, uh, people to uh, learn more about astronomy. Uh, he has given countless lectures, written countless articles. Uh, I've said it before, but uh, for me, he's the voice and face of Sky and Telescope. And uh, so, Kelly, thanks again for joining us. This is, uh, I believe, the third segment of his seven-part series on the past, present, and future of amateur astronomy. And you've got the stage, Kelly. Thank right. you. Thank, thank you so much, Scott. Thank you for those kind words. And David, thank you again for just getting us all in the right frame of mind for this. Um, you know, I got started in astronomy as many of you did many, many, many years ago. And um, we're gonna talk about that period of time uh, starting roughly in the 1970s and, and working forward. If, for those who weren't here for the first couple of times, I, I spoke first about the origins of amateur telescope making in the 1920s and then how that gradually slowly grew because there were no really uh, inexpensive telescopes that you could buy commercially. And then during the 50s and 60s, propelled by the space race, uh, we all were sort of enamored of what's out there. And, and I think that was the, in some ways, the golden age of amateur astronomy because there were um, telescopes started to become commercially available. Um, and there were lots of clubs forming. Some of the amateur clubs in the United States go back to that time and even before some of the biggest ones. So we're going to take up that story about uh, about the 19, mid 1950s, early 60s, just about the time that the space race was starting to heat up. Something else was happening in the United States, especially. And that is that power companies led by General Electric and Westinghouse had built these uh, power plants that ran 24 seven. But the demand for electricity at night wasn't nearly as great as it was during the daytime. And they couldn't exactly throttle back these power plants. So they looked for ways to use electricity at night. And it was during that period, the 50s and 60s, that these companies essentially gave away tens of millions of street lights to towns and cities across the country, across the U.S., hmm. uh, so that they would have uh, they would have a, a means of, of of using up this excess electricity. So many of the street lights that you see today got their start during that period. Now the first electric street lights dated from the 1880s. Thomas Edison himself. Uh, rolled out the first street lights and a power plant to, uh, to, to power them in New York City. Today, there are more than 300 million street lights worldwide. <laughs> and that is a problem for astronomy in that it has created gradually over time an increasing pall of light pollution in our skies, virtually all of our skies. There are not many of us who can claim to be a pla in places where there are, there's none. And, and so the lighting, not only did the street lights get rolled out in that period of time, but a, a dramatically more powerful kind of light called high intensity discharge uh, came about. And, and instead of having a simple incandescent bulb uh, lighting your street corner, um, there, these were brilliant new sources of light. And I, I wanna tell you about a book that sort of chronicles this whole thing. Uh, it's called Brilliant. Uh, it's by a woman named Jane Brox. It came out about 10 years ago. It's the story of the evolution of electric lighting or lighting in general uh, throughout the ages and with a lot of emphasis mm. on this period that I'm talking about. So, you know, we, we amateur astronomers got pushed out uh, into ever farther corners from our homes. Our backyards are no longer suitable for at, looking at the, the dimmest objects. And so we found ourselves at dark sky sites that our clubs might have had or, or had a special hideaway at a special lake outside the town. And, you know, the thing about progress is that often we as individuals can't stop it. And so you, you might have a really great place and then some farmer sells his or her land to a developer and suddenly there are 200 apartments where there used to be a field of wheat 
and all the lights that go with those 200 departments. And, and so suddenly your, your observing site is, is uh, diminished. Now, the interesting thing is that during this early phase of high intensity discharge lighting, there were, there were two kinds, three kinds of lights in particular that, that were the most common. Uh, one was mercury vapor, uh, which is essentially a fluorescent tube. One is something called high pressure sodium, uh, which is using sodium atoms as the exciting light giver. And I'll get to that in a second. And the third is something called metal halide. Now, the interesting thing about all three of these kinds of lights, and, and the most common turned out to be high pressure sodium, which is, are the lights that have that kind of peachy color. And they are rolled out all over our landscape. And, you know, they're annoying, but they have one... Uh, uh, saving grace, if you will. And that is that their light is, is nearly monochromatic and it's pretty easy to filter out. So even if you're in a location with a lot of light pollution, uh, the, the, the light from high pressure sodium and metal, uh, mercury vapor too can be fairly easy filtered out with a, with a light pollution filter. And, and therein lies the tale, right? We all as visual observers and maybe as, as photographic observers uh, started using these light pollution filters so that we could see the sky that we lost uh, to, to light sources. Well, the situation has gotten worse. Uh, according to the International Dark Sky Association, which was founded in 1988 in Tucson, uh, in part to protect the, the pristine dark skies over Kitt Peak, about 40 miles to the southwest outside of town, uh, according to the IDA, the, the increase in light pollution is about right now about twice the rate of the growth in population. And so we've, we've kind of grown accustomed to having this pall of light over us all the time, which is really unfortunate. It makes it much more difficult to do visual observing. Uh, and there are tricks that photographers can use that we'll get into probably next week or the week after that to sort of uh, to cheat uh, cheat light pollution and, and still get great views, but but our, our 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 observing, our visual observing has taken a hit. And for those of us who like peering into the eyepiece and seeing light from the Andromeda galaxy that's traveled for two and a half million years to go through the entrance of our telescope, become focused, and reach our eye through the eyepiece, um, that's, a, that's really a heady thing. And we're, we're able to experience less and less of that thanks to light pollution. I wanna conclude with talking a little bit, oh, about, about uh, LEDs, light emitting diodes, which like that Clint Eastwood movie can be good, bad, or downright ugly. <laughs> LEDs are great, you know, right now we're undergoing a once in multi-generational change in the way we light the night. Uh, LEDs have totally transformed the night. They are allowing us as never before to light the night inefficiently, uh, I mean, e efficiently, uh, and compounding that with the fact that we're now sort of a 24 seven society. You know, the, the, back in the 60s, when I was getting started observing, there was no such thing as all night uh, diners or, or gas stations or CVSs or McDonald's or all of those things. And so when, it, when night came, it got pretty dark. Now we have to contend with all of those lights all the time and they're converting to LEDs. LEDs, unlike high pressure sodium and these other former sources, uh, emit more blue light than their predecessors did. And blue light is the bane of amateur astronomy. Uh, most of you are familiar with the concept of Rayleigh scattering, why our daylight skies are blue. The underlying physics in that is that uh, the scattering of photons of light increases as the, as the uh, inverse fourth power of the wavelength. And that means basically in, in simpler terms is that a photon of blue light scatters 16 times more readily than a photon of red light. And so it's the blue light in these LEDs that is, is exacerbating a lot of the light pollution issues that we have. And um, 
and and you know we have satellites i'm sure every one of you has seen a photograph of the earth at night um taken by satellite many of those were from an, an earlier version of satellite called the dmsp satellites that were fairly panchromatic they took in all wavelengths of light and the newer ones that have replaced it are actually kind of blind at the blue end of the wavelength so they are not showing you the full impact of light pollution. I, I want to, Scott, I don't, I'm not sure if I can share the screen here. I think you can. Let me try doing that. Go ahead. Uh, this is a website. There we go. Yeah. Uh, this is a website called light pollution, light pollution map dot info. And there is a, uh, there is a, feature of this called light trends. This is one of the most useful sites. If you want to check out light pollution in your area, I happen to have put a push pin in Springdale, Arkansas. Oh, uh, home to explore scientific. And I want to show you a neat trick that you can do over here on the control panel. There's a little uh, polygon okay. you click on that. And I can draw a, a box around Springdale. I hope you can all see that. Yeah. And then I can create a chart of the growth in light pollution in Springdale over the last decade. Wow. Just like it's that easy. And so for those of you who are trying to convince your local officials that there is a problem with light pollution, this would be an invaluable tool. Um, and, and I'm happy to report, Scott, that your, your light pollution there in Springdale, although you're hard, hardly the best Bortle class in terms of viewing. Right. Not increased dramatically in the last decade. And part of the reason for that is that uh, although the number of lights has gotten, gotten a lot uh, more numerous, uh, the control of them has gotten better. Uh, yeah. we, we now have lights that, that, that LEDs in particular that shine down on the ground. And unlike a... Um, a high pressure sodium light that uses one of these doohickeys on top to turn on at dusk and off at dawn, LEDs can be, troll, can be controlled infinitely finely all through the night. And a lot of the new installations are actually computer addressable. Each, each street light has its own IP address. And so it can be uh, dimmed and brought up, uh, it can be dimmed say from midnight to 5 a.m. And so there is promise there. And so I, I wanna close by encouraging all of you to do two things. First of all, learn about light pollution and, and what its state is in your community and lean on the IDA, which is darksky.org is the website for the IDA. And the second thing I want you to do is a fun project. Uh, and this has uh, been promoted for at least a decade now called Globe at Night, globeatnight.org. It's a citizen science project that allows you without any uh, any equipment at all to gauge the darkness of your sky just by sort of crudely determining the, the limiting magnitude of how faint are the stars that you can see. And you enter that data into a, uh, that observation into a, a global database. And you would think, well, that's kind of simplistic and, and crude, but realistically, uh, there are a few light pollution scientists people who actually study the growth of light pollution versus population or, or lighting trends, they use that Globe at Night database uh, as the ground truth for all of these satellite images. So I encourage you to all participate in globeatnight.org. Um, tell your friends, it was originally designed as a kind of educational activity and it's become uh, really a sort of backbone of our efforts to at least assess light pollution worldwide. So we might not be able to see as many faint things in the sky as we used to, uh, but they are still there waiting for us. So you need to find those dark sites, dark sites to to appreciate them as as uh, we used to be able to just anywhere. Now we need to work a little harder at it. So that's it for tonight. Scott, back to you. Thank you, thank you, Kelly. There is a question from the audience. Uh, Ron Craig. Uh, I'm not sure where he's watching from, but he asks, are we reaching a precipice where ground-based astronomy is coming to an end unless something is done? Ah, very good question, Ron. Um, I think the answer is, is no. There are still plenty of dark enough places. Uh, earlier 
I asked Gary uh, Palmer where he was in, in the UK and he says he's in Wales. At Sky and Telescope, we, we saw this amazing photo and, and we've all seen these uh, that happened to be taken from downtown London, this glorious nebula. Uh, and, and so we might not be able to, to use our eyes as well as we used to, but our cameras are pretty clever and the camera operators are pretty clever and we can kind of peel back the light pollution uh, to see to see what is still there, I don't think we're at a precipice yet. The the re one of the real dangers actually is the advent of uh, these global satellite networks like Starlink uh, yeah. that are threatening to just completely choke our skies with satellites so that we won't be able to really enjoy or photograph uh, a deep sky object. Uh, without their interference. They'll photobomb every every shot you take. And I suspect a lot of the astrophotographers who are here with us tonight have already had that experience. So I, that, that's the greater worry, I think, in, in my mind, the, just the proliferation of satellites in orbit. There are certainly plenty of them there now. Light pollution is certainly a problem, problem no, no question about it. Uh, but as Dave Crawford, the, the, the founder, co-founder of the IDA once told me, you know, it took decades for light pollution to get this bad. And it's gonna take decades for us to get our, our arms around it and and uh, and defeat it. So it's, it's really, we have to be in this for the long haul. Right, yeah. If I could just interrupt for a second here, uh, listening to Kelly talk about uh, light pollution was one thing, but when he started talking about Sky and Telescope, the magazine of record for astronomy brought me back so beautifully back. In the 1950s, in a way, the golden era of Sky and Telescope was when some of the major discoveries in cosmology were first announced in that, on the pages of that magazine. For example, the discovery of spiral structure in the Milky Way was not first announced in a professional journal, but on the pages of Sky and Telescope. I just wanted to share that with you, Kelly. <laughs> Thank you, David. I, I confess I was not writing for it yet. And I wasn't quite old enough to be reading it yet, but you're absolutely right. Uh, I've, I've been with Sky Telescope for something like 45 years, and I have seen a lot in those 45 years. Um, and it continues. It's uh, coming up on its 80th anniversary. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, well, this, is, this has been a great start uh, to uh, this whole star party. I'm... I'm uh, you know, if I at any star party anywhere in the world that you might go to to have this kind of warm up is uh, is a great way to get started. I hope you're uh, feeling it at this point. Um, uh, our next uh, speaker is our youngest speaker, and we call her Libby in the Stars. Her name is Libby. She's ten years old, uh, and uh, her presentation today is going to be about Mercury and. Um, uh, when I first uh, met uh, Libby, I believe I met her possibly at a star party, a stargazing event. Um, and she uh, and her parents uh, came into the store uh, looking for a way to upgrade her telescope. And, um, uh, you know, I felt, uh, I really felt that Libby was special um, and that she, that she had, was someone, one of the youngest people I've met that has completely wrapped herself around uh, the, her love for space exploration, uh, her love for astronomy. Uh, she started with a small telescope to begin with, uh, taught, I think she's teaching her mom and her friends on how to use it. <laughs> but uh, uh, she is, um, it's fabulous to have her with us tonight. Um, and so I'm gonna, Libby, I'm gonna turn the stage over to you. Here you are. So Mercury formed over 4 billion years ago when the solar system first set up. And gravity pulled swirling gas and regular gas together to create a planet. And that was the closest to the sun. And it's not hot and it isn't cold, but in the day it is extremely hot. And at night, it doesn't have an atmosphere to retain the heat. So all the hot just spills out into space. So it is extremely cool at night. And now the, the, it has an exosphere 
instead of an atmosphere because atoms were pushed off the surface by solar winds. And the surface is just like our moon. It has craters and NASA names them after uh, artists, artists, authors, and musicians. And Mercury is almost completely upright on its axis. It's only upright by two degrees. And so it does not experience seasons. And it spins on its axis very slowly, but it goes around the sun at one, 29 miles per second. And ma Mercury has a metallic core and the mantle is only 250 miles long. So the core is the biggest part and then the outside is only 250 miles long. So, <laughs> and it completes one rotation around the sun every 59 Earth days. And it completes one day and night cycle every 176 days because of its axis. And I've never found Mercury in my telescope before because I just got into telescope business this year. But I have seen pictures and it's about to come into its, uh, I forgot the name, but it's about to go into some seasonal thing. I for did forget the name, but um, I think some other planets are going into it too, some cool thing. I forgot the name. It's okay. <laughs> Mercury, instead of an atmosphere, it has an exosphere. Like I said, it's made out of atoms. And that's it. I didn't have a lot of time. And I couldn't find a lot because <laughs> it's did just kind of like our moon. It's just a itty bit bigger than our moon. But there's one did more. <laughs> Ray it Mercury has a radius of 1,500. 116 miles and the radius is from the begin the core of the planet all the way out to the surface did you mean it was uh at the greatest elongation from the sun is that what you were i forgot the name approaching I that <laughs> i was looking at it and i was looking at some mercury pages mm-hmm Excellent. <laughs> well, Libby, thank you. Thank you for... Sorry, you don't have a lot. I couldn't find too much on Mercury. Well, we learned, I think we learned a lot already. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I think that at this point, we're going to take a, uh, a question. We, we do door prizes at the... Um, uh, you know, during the uh, Global Star Party. And uh, Terry Mann was kind enough to come in and, um, and be with us from the Astronomical League. And they are conducting the questions. They are uh, confirming the winners. And uh, they're deciding what the door prizes are going to be. So that's, that's great. So, Terry, I, I, you've got the spotlight at this point. Thank you, Scott. Libby, you did a great job. We need you in the Astronomical League. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so for the question, you're going to need to find the answer on our Facebook page. So the question is, what is the name of the Astronomical League Observe program created for kids 10 years and under? Yep, now remember, you have to send in your answer to Kent at explorescientific.com and those answers uh, will be emailed over to the Astronomical League officers and uh, here let me just type it into the chat right here and then they will select the uh, they'll select the winners and they'll actually announce it uh, in email back to the winners themselves we'll announce those winners uh, again at the next star party um, but um, Anyways, I really appreciate the league joining up with us and, you know, partnering with our programs and, um, you know, uh, the league is, uh, how many clubs now? It's 300 and 
304, I believe. 304 clubs. And so you must have nearly 20,000 members. Is that right? Yeah, right at 18,000 members right now. Okay. All right. That's great. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And you want to be a part of this, whether you're in the States uh, and belong to one of the clubs uh, that are league clubs, or you can become a member at large from anywhere in the world. So, correct? Yeah. Yep. Definitely can. So and we're working on clubs for the um, global to be international. Uh, we are beginning working on that. So we're hopeful to get some clubs from all over the world. That's awesome. Terry, thank you very much. Thank you. Scott. All right. All right. So next up will be uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Norman Fulham. And Norman uh, is someone a lot of us have known for a long time. Uh, Norman is a master uh, telescope maker. If you went to a shop today, you would see these giant, huge Dobsonians uh, that uh, he builds. Um, I think you might call them Dobsonians. Anyways, they're in giant uh, alt azimuth mounts, and uh, uh, they're the biggest amateur telescopes I think you can buy today. And um, but what I did not know, I knew I knew that Norman was this uh, uh, incredible craftsman, and uh, you know an, a, another guy in this hobby. I mean, if you get a chance to meet this guy, you're going to find out that uh, you know he's uh, he's kind. He has. Uh, uh, the best, um, uh, you know, he just exudes the character of uh, the best of what this amateur community has to offer. And uh, I didn't know that the guy is this musician. And so uh, Norman decided to join us today and, um, and play a piece for us. So Norman, you got the stage. Well, thank you a lot, Scott. And uh, for the kind words, I mean, it means a lot to me to, uh, to be, uh, remembered uh, among the uh, astronomers around the world. And um, just to, to set the table here, um, when I started to make telescope, and I, I was a, a musician all my life, since I'm about 10 years old, and guitar players and a singer. And um, when I started to do astronomy, uh, observing and star parties with friends, and um, I noticed that music and astronomy uh, were went so well together. I mean, when you observe the, the, the night sky and the galaxies and planets, and you hear some music in the background, soothing music, it, it goes so well together. So um, I, I never, uh, everywhere I go in a star party, I always have my guitar with me to surprise people sometimes just to, in the dark, you know, you hear music coming out from somewhere and then, oh, that's nice. That's it. It, it, it feels the mood and then uh, it's lovely to observe uh, with, a, with a nice music in the back. And of course, I had to build my guitar. <laughs> so, <laughs> everyone knows me as a woodworker. Uh, a few years back, uh, it was always been a dream of mine to, to build my own acoustic guitar. So uh, I bought some plans and read some books. And then uh, every day, that's my my only guitar that I make. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful. Tonight, like I, I was telling Scott, and thank you. I don't have much time on for me to to stay with you for very long because I, I have a big day for tomorrow. And um, but uh, next time I will join, I will make you a tour of the shop with uh, with my phone and then show you what whatever the project I'm working on right now. It's pretty pretty wild. Uh, I like the 48 inch uh, replacement mirror for the Great Melbourne Telescope in Australia. Uh, it's in the making right now. Uh, I've got about three 40 inches mirror in, in, on machines and so it's very interesting now. Mm -hmm. So for tonight, um, I'm going to play a song just to put you in the mood of uh, friendship because astronomy, I think, is a, it's a best way to make friends and to, uh, to gather with people and then enjoy the night sky and friendship is built on astronomy i think so it's an, an old song called james taylor actually carol king composed the song but james taylor promoted it more, a lot more <laughs> Down and 
trouble and you need a helping hand and nothing oh nothing is going right close your eyes and think of me and soon I will be Just call up my name And you know wherever I am I come running To see you again Winter, spring, summer, or fall All you've got to do is call And I'll The sky above you should turn dark and full of clouds in that cold north wind begins to blow keep your head together and call my name out loud now I'll be knocking upon your door You just call up my name And you know wherever I am That I come running To see you again But winter, spring, summer, fall all you've got to do is call, and I'll be there, yes I will. It ain't good to know that you got a friend when people can be so cold. They'll hurt you, and desert you, and they'll take your soul if you let them, oh yeah, but don't you let them. You just call up my name And you know wherever I am I come running To see you again Winter, spring, summer, fall All you've got to do is call And I'll be there, yes I will Wow. <laughs> I have the biggest knot in my throat. <laughs> that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Norman, thank you so much. Uh, we are really looking forward, really looking forward to um, visiting you again. Um, and uh, hopefully it's in the, next, in the next week or the weeks coming up whenever you have the opportunity. Always on a Tuesday night? Yeah, we're keeping them on Tuesday nights. Um, we This time we also have a Friday night star party, which will be uh, going from Europe, maybe all the way down to Australia. So if you want to make it sooner, we could probably do that too. And so what time would that be Friday? That would be in the uh, here central time uh, would start at about 4 p.m. So about 5 p.m. your time. Oh, that'd be better, better for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'd so be you, very happy to make uh, give you a, a tour of the shop on Friday. Yeah, that's great. You showed me a long time ago, and yeah, I, was, I know <laughs> I'm blown away by it. So that's great. Um, well, thank you, everybody, and uh, I hope to see you very soon. Thanks, Norman. Thanks for that great song. Thank, thank you. you. 
Okay. Well, I wanted to give everyone kind of a, uh, a group introduction here. Uh, as you see it on the screen up here on our top left is Richard Grace, also known as Astro Beard. Astro Beard is a, uh, is a uh, astrophotographer, very dedicated, uh, still relatively fresh into the hobby of astrophotography, but he's doing a great job. Of course, myself, you know. Uh, Don Davies uh, from Austin, Texas is with us and uh, the Austin Astronomical Society. Of course, Kelly Beatty, who just uh, gave us a, a great talk. Gary Palmer, who's going to uh, uh, show us some image processing a little bit later. Steve Malia from Ontario Telescope is with us. David Ng uh, out there in Los Angeles, hopefully not too much smoke. Uh, but I, I fear that maybe they'll, they'll be that way. Ajay, you're in uh, Canada, I think. Is that right? No, not in Canada anymore. Okay. Oh, no, I'm not currently in Canada because uh, the border is closed and I can't get to the observatory. Oh, jeez. Okay. No, I'm, in, I'm in Seattle right now. You're in Seattle. Okay. All right. Terry Mann, who uh, joined us a little bit earlier uh, to read off uh, uh, our first uh, door prize question uh, from the Astronomical League. Jerry Hubble, Vice President of Engineering for Explore Scientific and one of the directors of the Mark Slade Remote Observatory. Ron Delvo. Uh, Ron gave us a, a, a very uh, a comprehensive uh, overview of all the things that he's been involved with in astronomy over the years. That was great. Uh, you're out in Arizona. Yep. Tyler Bowman. Uh, Tyler's one of our customer service reps, dedicated astrophotographer. Um, uh, he's been busy since he joined Explore Scientific. He's been busy upgrading his equipment. So. <laughs> We hope he doesn't go broke in the meantime. <laughs> Bob Denny. Uh, uh, Bob's an old friend and an old friend uh, to many of us in, in uh, amateur astronomy. And, and his wife, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten your name. <laughs> this is Denny. Stevie. Stevie is uh, with me here. <laughs> so Great. So what did you think of uh, uh, Norman Ful Fulham's? Uh, oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. I, I, I should mention that I met Scott in like 2000, I think, or 2001, when yeah. he was at Mead. Mm -hmm. And we had a meeting at Mead in the bordering. Mm -hmm. And Scott was yeah. there and actually set that up for me. So yeah. we go back a ways. Uh, yeah, you flew out with your DC-3, I think, at that time. So oh, it was with the baby DC-3, the Baron. <laughs> All right. Well, very cool. Abigail Bolenbach, uh, who is w now with Astronomy Magazine and uh, doing uh, her program. Uh, is that weekly now, Abby? You're, you're muted, Abby. Can we hear me now? Yeah, you can talk. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> okay, I better, I better hush. I better be careful. No, um, it's every other week. So. Every other week. Okay. All right. Hopefully one day we will get caught up, uh, but COVID has put a huge setback on everyone's schedule, so it is still every other week. Every other week. Okay. Well, no problem. But you're I know you're doing a great job. Thank you. Libby and the stars uh, who gave us, uh, you know, some insight into the planet Mercury. So now this is not all the people that are going to be on our show tonight. We're going to have people that are going to come on later. That would include... Um, uh, Cesar Brolo from Argentina, uh, uh, from Optica Sirocco. Um, we have um, uh, also uh, Chibo Space and Science Center with uh, Rich Chozer and uh, um, McKee, Garrett, uh, Garrett McKee, I think is his name. And uh, so they may have that up and live. Um, but at this point, we're going to take a little 10 minute break, okay? And we are going to come back with Don Davies. Uh, and then Abigail Bolenbach, I think, is going to read some poetry to us. But we'll find out about astronomy in Texas from Don and, um, and what that's all about. And so we'll be, be back in 10. OK. If you guys want to get uh, something to wet your whistle. Um, this would be a good time. So can we talk now without it being broadcast? No, but you can talk with me. <laughs> 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 
What were you going to say about your controversial stuff? <laughs> yeah, I was going to get on a soapbox maybe and start ranting and raving maybe. No, that's not true. Big. All right, that's cool. Yeah. Now, we, get, we put people in a state of hypnosis now by having them look at the Hubble deep field again and again for 10 minutes. So, But I'll be right back, guys.
Hey, Scott, do you mind if I say one little thing? Go ahead. I just uh, found out, probably everybody here knows who Richard Berry is. He's the guy who kind of came up with CCD imaging with the cookbook CCD way years ago and probably a well-known to all of us. Unfortunately, his house is barn and everything got burned today. Oh, my God. Yeah. And uh, he has alpacas. And you guys probably know about my thing, well, the thing uh, of the alpaca protocol, and that's named after his alpacas. And they're okay. The alpacas survive. But unfortunately, his house and his barn did not. So what a, it's all just kind of yeah. think about Richard. Yeah. Yeah. Richard has done so much for this, for all well, of this community, you know, so. Yeah, he really has. Right. So. You know, one of the pioneers of, uh, I think, one of the first popular uh, uh, CCD processing uh, programs. And, uh, you know, Ajay, Ajay Segal, that's here with us, too. You know, he took, uh, he took image processing to a quantum leap with MED uh, processing software. So, you know. And, and Richard, Richard was, is a very, very old friend. We collaborated in the early days. I mean, I think Richard gets full credit for democratizing uh, what was the purview of the very few with CCD astronomy. Right. Yep. 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 I would agree. Say so. Yep. Well, goodness. It's terrible news. Yeah, it's sort of sad news. I just saw that today. So occasionally uh, one of our friends runs into hardships like this and, uh, you know, I have seen the amateur astronomy community really come together, too, to help people out, you know, and maybe um, maybe there's something we can do together um, to make that happen. And sadly, I haven't talked to Richard in a while, so... Okay, we just have a few seconds left here of our break. Um, up next will be Don Davies. Uh, you know, I'm seeing uh, posts here from, in our live chat uh, with uh, condolences for, um, you know. Richard and, uh, and his family during this hard time, so. But the good thing is, is that he's okay, so. Okay, someone here wanted to know what that animated star background is, and to be very honest with you, uh, I <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but I found it on I found it on a, a NASA site, and uh, and you can find it too. So, but um, uh, also joining us uh, uh, is uh, Dustin Gibson, and we have Steve Malia. But right now we're going to go to Don Davies. I'm going to give you the stage, Don, and uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on in Austin and astronomy. Absolutely, I'd be happy to do so. Um, well, first off, I'm very excited to announce uh, that this month 
the Austin Astronomical Society is going to be going live with our general meetings. Um, so that is available and can be viewable on YouTube. And that link can be found on the website, austinastro.org. Um, even more exciting is our guest presenter this month is Kirk Batty, who's going to be talking about the antique Thera mechanism, uh, the device. So that should be a really fascinating talk. Uh, lately, a new group has formed called the Travis County Friends of the Night Sky. So we have more activism and more feet on the ground trying to do things to preserve our night skies, to educate about light pollution, um, and hopefully allow astronomers and people in general to be able to observe the night sky from a relatively urban uh, city area. Um, otherwise, we are um, also looking forward to a collaboration with the Hill Country Alliance for October Night Sky Month. Um, so uh, pay attention to some of the, the websites, both the Austin Astro Org website, uh, our Facebook page for Travis County Friends of the Night Sky, as we're going to have a lot of talks, virtual star parties, uh, presentations, activities, just a whole lot of things going on in the month of October to help bring awareness to our uh, bright skies and how everyone can do their part in uh, lessening that and making our stars more visible. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. Uh, uh, we will um, uh, try, I'll try to tune in for sure. And, uh, you know, if, uh, Don, if you'd like to uh, give me more information about it, and I'll spread it on social media and get it out, get the word out, because you guys have a great uh, community going down there. And, um, you know, it is the, uh, it's the home of Stardate, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. Well, through, through their university, uh, Austin, yes. Many, many of us have listened to it on NPR and stuff. Uh, up next is Abigail Bolenbach. Abigail wanted to join us for a little while. She had some poetry she wanted to read. So I think that's fantastic. And uh, so you've got the stage now, Abigail. Hi, everyone. Um, I would like to first start out with I'm in the middle of a thunderstorm. So my connection might get lost or I might get a little scratchy. So bear with that. Uh, today, I kind of wanted to venture into the more artistic side and romantic side of astronomy. And I kind of wanted to start off with a, a humorous poem. At least it humored me. One of my biggest thrills in astronomy um, are quasars and pulsars, the extreme of space, right? And so whenever I was doing some research, I ran across this poem and I actually included it in one of my presentations that I've given many times. And it's by uh, George Gamow. And he actually wrote this during his research, the breaking um, uh, advances that they made with quasars and basically radio astronomy. It was in 1964. And at that time, I can't imagine how frustrating it could have been to see something that was a quasar, but try to interpret it. And so this was his uh, kind of interpretation of it. He said, twinkle, twinkle, quasi star, biggest puzzle from afar. How unlike the other ones, brighter than a billion suns. Twinkle, twinkle, quasi star, how I wonder what you are. And it's just a short little poem, but I will definitely be teaching my children that instead of the general twinkle, twinkle star <laughs> poem. They will know the quasar one for sure. <laughs> but I just, I, I love that to me. It's, uh, it brings a little bit of levity to the extreme nature of quasars. And I thought it'd be kind of a nice, light, uh, uplifting poem. The other ones are a little more serious. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one I'll read is by John Keats. It was uh, in like early 18, it might be like 1810, he wrote this, uh, and it's called Bright Star. And this poem basically represents uh, his, he was trying to show and express how he wanted to be constant with uh, his fiance. And his inspiration was uh, what we believe to be as um, Polaris actually. And so uh, the poem goes, bright star, would I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor hung aloft the night and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient sleepless eremite, 
the moving waters at their priest-like task, a pure ablution at their human shores, <clears throat> or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains or the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, to feel forever its soft fall and swell, awake forever at a sweet unrest, still to hear the tender taken breath, and so live ever or else swoon to death. And to me, it's very romantic in the sense of one that would be wonderful if uh, someone wrote a poem like that for me, but in the sense of comparing it to Polaris, stars fluctuate in the night sky and we see them change in brightness. And if one in that time saw a star and uh, were inspired for their fiance and to imagine the different pulses and, and automatically compare it to how their lover, you know, breathed whenever they watched them sleep. I just, to me, that's so tender and beautiful. The next one is none right other than uh, by Longfellow, and um, it's not a, a, a super long, complex poem like some of his, um, but this one, I think, was his interpretation of it um, kind of just represents the significant aspect of being selfless and Kind of, I think his interpretation of understanding his position in the universe, but just being absorbed by the night sky and just it being like a dark night sky. Um, however, uh, some different turns and, and loops happen throughout the poem. So uh, here it goes. The night is to come, but not too soon. The si silently sinking, all silently, the little moon drops down behind the sky. There is no light in earth or heaven, but the cold light of stars. And the first watch of the night is given to the red planet, Mars. Is it the tender love of stars or the star of love and dreams? Oh no, from that blue tint above, a hero's armor gleams. And earnest thoughts within me rise, when I behold afar, suspended in the evening skies, the shield of that red star. O oh, star of strength, I see thee stand and smile upon my pain. Thou beckonest with thy mailed hand, and I am strong again. Within my breast there is no light, but the cold light of stars. I give the first watch of the night to the red planet Mars, the star of the unconquered will, he rises in my breast, serene and absolute and still and calm and self-possessed. And thou too, who sayer thou art, that readest this brief psalm as one by one thy hopes depart, be resolute and calm. Oh, fear not in a world like this, and thou shall not ere long know how sublime a thing it is to suffer and be strong. And I think there's many meanings attached to this poem. Uh, it, he was going through a very rough time in his life and when he wrote this, but in a sense, it shows uh, another level of, of being steadfast, uh, if you must, if you were to dream like he was when he wrote this uh, and, and imagine yourself in, in a very dark spot and one you know, little bright light that might have been cold, but just just warm enough to to give that inspiration to keep going uh, was Mars. And you know they didn't have perseverance then, so I don't know if if uh, I mean we'll find out soon enough if Mars is tender or if it could have love, um, or if it does smile upon our pain. Uh, I'm sure perseverance will let us know that. But uh, he didn't have rovers back then; they just had um, you know their uh, their own interpretation of it and uh and his was through poetry and i think uh these poems represent beautiful different aspects of uh astronomy that's uh related to back to the arts so i uh, that's it scott wow okay that was great <laughs> thank you fantastic i uh you know it is so um inspiring 
to listen to such poetry and uh, you know and your 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 interpretation of them is uh, amazing and thank you it's fun to read the the live chat coming through here I don't know if you can see some of this but um, uh, people are enthralled uh, and uh, enraptured by uh, by your poetry uh, thank you thank you very much no, I, I I can't read it I'm not actually that technologically savvy yet. Uh, I may seem that I am because I'm working with the world of uh, and the constraints of COVID and and um, this online persona, but not not as uh, as savvy as it may seem. So no, I'm I'm not seeing the live chats. <laughs> we're all still learning. We're still learning, and we're trying to share this experience. So Abby, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Scott. Okay. Uh, by chance, I would like to interject just slightly. Is Libby still here? Uh, who? Libby. Yes, she is. Yes, she is. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Hi, Libby. I just wanted to say I so appreciate your enthusiasm and you're doing a fantastic job. Right now, I am nervous talking. So I know that for the first presentation for you to give on here, you must be a little nervous and you did wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And at such a young age, don't let anything get in your way of the passion, whether it changes from astronomy to uh, maybe something oceanic, or if it uh, is a, spe a specific like uh, planetary science, uh, just just keep going. You're doing a great job. And it was absolutely wonderful getting to hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, before you go, um, Abby, I mean, certainly uh, I hope that you hang out with us uh, for the rest of the evening if you can. But if not, um, you know, uh, you're free to come and go to the, you know, as we go through the program. But I did want to uh, give you um, a chance to talk about uh, uh, your program and, um, and what, what you got coming up next. Sure. Uh, so I am working with Astronomy Magazine with our new video series. It's an educational video series where we cover uh, different astronomy topics, whether it's latest research or just more in-depth facts. And what I'm really hoping and what I'm really pushing for is uh, an in w the series is called Infinity and Beyond. It's actually rocket science. And what I would like to push for is an infinity beyond extreme. So what our original goal was is to kind of give as much knowledge and accessibility to people that are kind of in my age range. So from early teens to maybe 30s. And apparently their attention span is like 20 seconds. That's TikTok. And you can't really give that much really uh, good information where they'll be able to retain it in 20 seconds. So we kind of compromise at like five minute range. Well, for me, some certain topics I want to delve into more and just kind of nerd out on. And so hopefully sometime later, they will be an extreme episode series where it'll be like 10, 15 minutes and we'll just like crunch on the hard science. But anyway, um, Infinity and Beyond is uh just starting we've got six episodes out maybe seven uh I, you know i've i'm working on many ahead of those so i can maybe give you guys a little bit of a sneak peek the next one is going to actually be talking about a conspiracy so hmm. there'll be new grounds and hopefully we will have uh, a a conspiracy topic revolving in queue um because i mean i love conspiracies and who doesn't right Right. I will also give like one other snippet. It's uh, it has to do with something involving the physics of Earth. So there's there's all you need to know. Um, if you are a true like astro believer, maybe you'll know what I'm talking about. Maybe not. Uh, just stay tuned and watched. Uh, but it's basically just a, a quick little video segment on a particular topic. Uh, it's random selection. So I'm surprised every week. <laughs> Oh my God! Honestly. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Okay. Well, thanks. Thank you, Abby. Thanks again. All right. So, so we have Dustin Gibson uh, from OPT and Gibson Picks joining us. Uh, Dustin. Yeah, Dustin has uh, really uh, uh, been a sensation on uh, social media, uh, uh, both you know, and his his program 
that he's done in person, uh, the stuff that he's done on, uh, he has a program called, I think it's a podcast called Astro Junk. Uh, he has Gibson Picks, which uh, uh, started out on uh, Twitch. And um, uh, they, OPT is uh, a, a company that he and uh, Jenny St. Lawrence um, now own and manage, and they're both passionate about outreach and astrophotography. And uh, Dustin's become a great friend, and I'm going to give you the stage here, Dustin. Hey, thanks. I don't know that I need the stage. I'm not sure I'm deserving of that. Look at this group. The stage. Bring, <laughs> you bring this group together. I swear, Scott, I've known Scott a long time now, and he's like this magnet for just hyper intellectuals. And then I, I pop into this group and I look I'm like, how, how does Scott pull this off every single week? The guy's a juggernaut, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. And then Libby is here. I was listening to that actually while I was working before this. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I, I want to be like Libby when I grow up. <laughs> now, <laughs> right now, I still want to be like Libby. One day I want to graduate to that level. It's so impressive. And it's so refreshing to see because it just what it means is that the industry as a whole is doing something right. Right. And I know that we, we, we talk about it all the time, Scott, like we carry the weight of that. Let's make sure that we drive this forward. And, you know, I mentioned this in a post, but let's pass the baton, not like not just to prove that it's been heavy, but instead to say, drive this forward. And here's everything we've learned and everything that you can push forward to really take this to the next level and seeing that and seeing William on the channel and then, you know, seeing uh, Aurelius comes on here and it's just all of that stuff is so inspiring. And I don't even think, you know, I think that they look up to the older generation. And the truth is, every time I come on, I'm more inspired. I go to work the next day. Like, I really got to do this because these kids. <laughs> oh, yeah. Taking it to the next level, you know. Right. Right. It's amazing. Yeah, so it, uh, we were talking earlier today, uh, Dustin and I were talking about, uh, uh, you know, the, the work that, um, uh, that it takes to uh, be in this industry and to work with uh, uh, the community. And, you know, I always, I've always said that, um, you know, it's important, it's important for us uh, in, in the community uh, uh, to, support those that support us you know i mean it, it's it's uh there are there are people that go to work in our industry uh they can't wait for the day to be over uh when they go home they don't want to think about telescopes they don't want to think about star parties they don't want to think about astronomers or astronomy or anything they want to go home and return back to what they call their uh regular lives and um uh, uh, you know what you're seeing here. This community right here, uh, okay, is this is the these are people who are. Um, it is their lifestyle. Uh, it is their passion. Uh, they all, everyone here, has done uh, incredible uh, work in educational outreach. It's awesome to see Libby uh, come in and start at such a young age. Um, you know, so uh, but. Um, Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about uh, what's happening with uh, uh, OPT, Gibson Picks, and also Clear Skies Network, which we're streaming on right now. Thank you very much. Uh, no, happy to do it. Happy to do it. And um, yeah, it's it's really so. My role is meant to be a support role, obviously, and so we're trying to just build the infrastructure to make things happen. And you know, we've actually got uh, one of our team here. I just saw in the Facebook chat. Ron Sparkman is here, and I feel like we definitely have to tip the hat to Ron. In the last month of her live streams for all of us, Ron had Neil deGrasse Tyson on live, um, Elon Musk, Bill Nye, um, I mean, countless CEOs. The guy is just, uh, he's, a, he's a Scott Roberts, right? So he's, he's pulling this stuff together and making it happen for people. And deGrasse Tyson on. So, yeah. But, uh, it's, uh, awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. And I mean, that stuff should exist in having people that are this passionate. And I mean, looking yeah. at the group, I, I know most of the people here. And so, um, you know, I'm very honored and it's a privilege to be a part of. But I think that the infrastructure still it's still a little underdeveloped and it's time to really put a lot of effort, the resources, whatever it takes to drive that forward, because, you know, we can talk about things like like STEM, we everybody cares about STEM education, right? But 
yeah. we, we recognize the problems there. The infrastructure doesn't exist. I mean, in the States, we have a problem, um, you know, with, with STEM, especially, you know, I grew up in Alabama. I can tell you, I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I ever heard the word telescope until I was in college. Um, you know, and we've got to make these things accessible. We've got to create pathways for interest. And, and, you know, once somebody does have that spark, we've got to have the next step, you know, people like us that can reach people instead of, you know, we can't be dependent on a star party out in the middle of the desert that you have to drive three hours to, and, you know, people don't trust these situations as new newcomers, you know, it's gotta be stuff like this, these digital ways to reach mm -hmm. a ton of people and reach people for free and open the open the door to interest just interest right because that's the spark and then we start trying to get telescopes in people's hands and all of a sudden you know you've got the next generation talking about important things and carrying like i said the baton forward and so that's the mission those are the things we're trying to do and i can tell you that you know as far as the social media stuff like my personal stuff is mostly dedicated to the observatory project i use the observatories that we've built so far. So these are free observatories to use for the public that we're building around the world. We're building a network of 62 observatories around the world to just let people log into for free and to do projects with people around the world. So that like we use one to have five people that didn't know each other from around the world take one photo. So they all had to log in, take one filter on one target, but they had to agree on the target and then we combine it and then you get a global collaboration on an image and you're teaching people, those people are sharing it and it becomes this big positive feedback loop of astronomy interest and conversation. Yeah. Um, but that's what the observatory network is about and that's what most of my time there is dedicated to is sharing images and um, I'm, I'm a philosophy nerd, so philosophical perspectives attached yeah. to those and just hoping that it's enough to spark a question, just spark that that first hint of, hey, what is that? Like that's that's all it takes. It's all it took for me. I changed my entire life path to be part of this, you know. So that's, awesome. uh, that's the goal. That's what we're doing. That's what we're trying, and that's why we are building, you know, the networks that we're building. Well, wow. congratulations on all that work, and uh, you know, I'm waiting for uh, many more exciting things to come uh, from from you and from all the people you're working with. You know, it's it's really, um, I would say that um, it it I can see you taking every opportunity to uh, get the word out and to inspire people from around the world. And thanks for coming on our show again. So, no, I'm happy to. And you're doing this. At, where where are you right now, Scott? I'm here in Arkansas. Here but in you're you're in your office, aren't you? You're not even at home. <laughs> and what time is it? It's 11:30 at night. You know, so that, that is his home, Dustin. Don't you know that's his home? There's my there's my uh, my roommates over here, and and uh, you know, and I'm working on this telescope back here. So pretty soon I'll get it up and running, and uh, we'll show you some live stuff. But. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Dustin. Um, uh, so up next is Ajay Seagal. And Ajay is uh, an amazing individual. Um, when I think of uh, some of, you know, near genius level um, uh, intellect, uh, definitely Ajay comes to mind. He has, uh, um, you know, he's a technologist. Uh, he's been hired by some of the most amazing uh, tech companies in the world. And uh, he's taking those companies to the next level. He's been featured in Forbes magazine um, as an amateur astronomer. He is so cool. Uh, this is a guy you can come up to and meet. And he's just, uh, you know, uh, as friendly as anyone else that, that you might meet at a star party. But if you could uh, look under the hood of what's going on uh, in Ajay's mind about uh, what's going to take uh, imaging, image processing, astronomy to the next level, uh, you would be certainly amazed. And, uh, you know, so uh, Ajay has a, uh, a close group of friends um, that, uh, um, you know, all sing the praises of this guy. And it's been my privilege to get to know him over the years. Uh, I, I wish that I had been able to spend more time under the stars uh, to learn more from him. But uh, uh, Ajay, uh, thanks for joining us on our uh, global star party. So it's great to have you here. And, and everyone knows Scott exaggerates, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Somebody, uh, you know, 
Scott's lying and they say by the by the his lips are moving. But that everything I just said is absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Well, well, thank you, Scott. I, I, I think you're exaggerating just a little bit. But um, so I, I just wanted to, to reflect a little bit on star parties in this time of COVID. And, you know, Scott, as you know, I'm, I'm a, a prolific star party uh, attendee. I, I, I've been to most of them across the United States and Canada at least once, and many that I attend on a regular basis. And, and uh, since this virus has hit us, since this pandemic hit us, I've been in star party withdrawal. Hmm. And myself and a group of friends got together. I wanted to talk a little bit about what, what, what you out there could do to have a star party. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit about LED lighting, uh, Kelly was talking about, and how in the cities, our skies have disappeared. Uh, where I am right now, I'm by the, the, the shore in Seattle in a, in a little town north of Seattle called Shoreline. And I can't see the Milky Way here. Um, about the only thing I could really observe from my backyard are the planets. And fortunately, they're in a pretty good position to view. So a group of us got together and said, what can we do to safely hold a star party during the time of COVID? And the keys are keep it to a very tight group of friends who know each other well. Um, make sure that you quarantine yourselves for two weeks prior to this, this star party because maintaining social distance around a, set, a telescope is, 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 is really hard because you all know how it goes, right? You look at something and you, it looks really cool. You go, oh, you gotta see this. Mars is so rock steady, you gotta see this. And then everyone crowds around the telescope. That's part of what a star party is. So, so what we all did is we, we there, there were a group of four of us who are regular attendees of the Table Mountain Star Party, which is held in Eastern Washington. And we said, okay, we, 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 we've got to take a week and we got to still celebrate that star party and go and observe. So we picked the new moon August week, which was um, promising to be uh, pretty decent from a, a weather perspective. Uh, Mars is getting really big in the sky. The planets were shining and the skies were absolutely gorgeous. So where do you go to hold a, a star party where you can be reasonably uh, secure and safe? Well, there's this really neat uh, concept that many of you may have already heard of called hip camps. And what hip camps are, are people renting out their land for people to camp, uh, much in the same style as Airbnb. And hip camps during COVID have gotten really popular because they tend to be very tiny. They, they have uh, a very few campsites. They must provide water as part of being a hip camp. So you, you, we had the most amazing fresh spring water. And you, they have to provide uh, bathroom facilities. So, well, toilet facilities. So we had, a, we had our little porta potty. And uh, my friend Glenn Wallace had his RV. So that gave us a little bit of shade and, and stuff. And, and my friend Matt Woodward, uh, had a had a camper trailer, so he, they brought those out. Uh, I'm hardcore. I stayed in this tent that you see behind me. It's a, it's a kinder tent, and, that, and this is actually a, a, an image that was taken one of the evenings out at the hip camp. Well, we 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 rented this hip camp, and um, they're not very expensive. They're, they 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 typically cost fifty dollars a night, and we had the whole place to ourselves. So right. the, we picked the darkest spot in in Washington, just um east of uh west of spokane and uh, east of Ephrata. unfortunately that whole area is on fire right now which is which is pretty darn sad and we were we were camped out amongst these rolling plains of wheat fields with the wheat about uh, two feet high and just moving in the wind and there was nothing out there except the four of us the coyotes and the landowner who was a, a wonderful a retired Air Force veteran who who was all by herself. She was she's a widow and uh, just absolutely loved the company. Uh, she was very hospitable. A place called the Stage Line Ranch, and we were able to hold our star party for the four of us and capture you know the good food that you cook the um, and 
we tend to go to extremes with with cooking uh, gourmet food at star parties. That's part part of our signature at the Table Mountain. So we had a lot of fun, and we had uh, an eighteen inch job. Um, we had two uh, high end uh, contraptions like the one behind me, um, and we had a thirteen inch job, and then uh, uh, a a bunch of other telescopes that we could uh, do planetary stuff with, and. We were able to pull this off safely. All of us got tested before going. Uh, we quarantined, and then we quarantined ourselves from our families when we got home, and nobody got sick, and we were able to hold a star party. So it is possible to get out under a dark sky during these terrible times. Um, it is possible to have a, uh, a measured uh, social gathering, um, as long as you don't keep it too big. And it's possible to do it safely and still enjoy this passion that we, we all share. And, yeah. and it was a, an absolutely wonderful time. That's great. That's great. Yeah, and, and there, there are, um, I can't tell you how many times that I've had uh, astronomy club presidents, uh, organizers of various star parties and stuff ask, how can they get this done? So, um, but uh uh, it looks like that is, is certainly um, certainly one way. And, uh, you know, thanks for sharing that, Ajay. That's great. Um, we, uh, we have a lot more people to go through here. Um, and uh, so we are going to uh, bring up Dave Ng from Los Angeles. You wanted to uh, share some of the uh, images that you had taken. So let me see if I'm going to do this right because I... <laughs> Sometimes I get carried away and uh, and forget to spotlight or pin the wrong person. So I think I I think I did it correctly this time. Does that look okay to you? Just a little bit of a lag. I don't see any change, Scott. I don't see any change either. Let's see. Let's see. Let me spotlight him. Let's see if that works. Oh, hey, there I am. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for having me on again, Scott. I really love these uh, virtual star parties. Um, I, I, as I probably told you before, I just got into astronomy maybe a couple years ago. Uh, I moved out here to you know uh, Temecula in Southern California. Went to my first star party, and that was the first time that I looked through a telescope, and I was just blown away. Um, since then, I've, I've joined the Temecula Valley Astronomers Club, and I really like, uh, you know, the images, the astrophotography, uh, the science behind it. That's all wonderful, but what really gets me is the, um, the outreach, the, the star parties. Um, I've been lucky enough to participate in a few for my club, and I got to tell you, the first time... Uh, an elementary school kid looks through my telescope and goes, wow, that's cool. That, that just really gets me. So that, that's uh, what I really love about this hobby. Anyway, um, last week, I was uh, trying to image with a new camera. And let me see if I can share my screen here. Uh, here we go. Share. All right, hopefully you can see that. So last week I was trying to image with the new camera. Um, you could barely see a little bit of the structure in there. And I was able to capture about two hours worth of data. And I ended up with uh, this image. Oh, wow. And so this, this is uh, IC 1396, the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. And I uh, used in a... a Optolong L enhanced filter. Uh, it's hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, and oxygen three. Wow. And this is from my light polluted backyard in Temecula. Now, so I think it did a little bit better than my previous ones, which are just the DSLR. And uh, from seeing your uh, setup live, Dave, uh, he does indeed have an extremely light polluted backyard. Um, so to pull this off is uh, nothing short of a miracle. It's fantastic. Thank you. Now, hopefully it'll get a little bit better. I actually can still see some of the dust motes that are were in there. 
So um, just a note to self, next time I put a new camera on there, I got to dust it off a little. Clean it up. Yeah. <laughs> right. I did use some flats, uh, but for some reason I just, I couldn't get them out. But anyway, that, that's what I ended up with from, uh, from last week. Unfortunately, this week, I'm not doing any imaging. The skies are all gray uh, from the fires. I'm not near any of them. Uh, I think the closest one is about 30 or 40 miles away, but still the skies are just completely gray. Well, so that, that's the only image that I had to share today. All right, Dave. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. It is a uh, very impressive. And, uh, you know, I know that if I made an image like that, I would be, um, I would be very, uh, I'd be proud of it for sure. <laughs> so, so I, th I think it's fantastic. And, and I'm, I, it's really cool, uh, to see someone uh, progress as quickly as you are. So oh, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So the next up here will be, uh, Gary Palmer. Gary is, uh, all the way in the UK. Um, and, um, uh, he is, uh, um, he is, uh, it's it's pretty late there at this point, uh, Gary. What time is it there? Uh, it's four forty in the morning, Scott. So... Four forty in the morning. You are you are officially the Astro Viking here. You know, although I don't think the UK had any Vikings, um, uh, but uh, you are. It, it is. Uh, uh, it's great to have you on. You've been on many of our programs. Uh, I don't think you sleep much. <clears throat> um, very limited. Um, I've had even less sleep. I've been uh, coaching Tyler over the weekend, so um, the weekend's been uh, quite long so far. Um, so, yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me back on. Um, we did some imaging at uh, the European Star Party. Yes. Um, and that was, um, it was a little bit, uh, rushed on everything there because I was sort of part presenting with you um, and trying to image and trying to do a hundred and one other things. So it it all went in a bit of a rush, but we did manage to get some imaging for a change, which is um, quite a result on one of these star parties because there's simply quite a lot of them clouded out at the moment. Um, so what I'll do is I'll share the screen over and we'll have a look at what we actually got. Um, I'll bring up Pete's Insight. Let's just drop this down. Um, what I thought I would look at is this area here seems to be uh, one of the main problems at the moment. Everybody seems to be suffering with the batch processing um, and actually calibrating the um, dark frames and flat frames and other um, calibration uh, areas. The other problem that people are having is that they've changed the, um, really what they're, they're saying now is to use the weighted batch. But the, the issue with that is it takes a real long time. Um, and on these sort of shows, we never really have enough time to run through this. So I've preloaded this up and we're just gonna um, open it up. It's gonna give me the warnings as usual. But really for basic imaging, there's no reason why we can't use this area. Um, still, uh, the weighted batch just takes a lot longer. It might be more precise, but it's just taking a lot longer. So these are all of the light frames that we got of M33. Um, we also took some flat frames, which I've put into masters, some darts, and some biases. The darts on this are exactly the same time and temperature as the light frames. And there's just under 60, I think there were 55 light frames in here. One of the key things on the light frames is in this area here, um, is not to optimize the darks. This causes all sorts of problems with the calibration. Um, it's a one shot color camera, so we need to debower it. So we need to have the CFA selected and we also need a little bit of information on what way the software writes, because this is where we, we seem to get a problem. If we use software like SharpCut, it writes in traditional fit format, where it writes from the bottom up. So that means on the actual image here, it's writing the file from the bottom up. 
and that changes this debayer area. Um, if we were using an ASI Air Pro, for instance, that would write from the top down. So the debayer would be RGGB. But if we were using sharp cap, we would have to swap that to GBRG. And if these are not correct, then we can get all sorts of problems with the stars not aligning. We can get errors coming up all the time. But if we are reversed and we're writing from the bottom up, we need to make sure that the up bottom fits box is unchecked. Then we just select a folder here where we want them to go out and a reference frame. So normally the one from the beginning or one from in the middle. If you've had a little bit of drift on the mount, it's quite often an idea to do one in the middle as a reference frame. Once that all runs, if everything runs correctly, yeah, then we go into, um, let me just come out of that, uh, image integration. Yeah, and then we uh, stack the images together, basically. Um, once we've got the image integration up, let me just find it. Obviously, some of these windows I can't keep open at the same time. So if they're dynamic processes or whatever, then I have to close them. So we load this in, and this is really where we get rid of the satellite trails. This is the area that we wipe all of the, the trailing things, aeroplanes, different other bits out of the image. Um, so once we loaded them in, we then want to go for uh, Windsor, Windsor Eyes Sigma Clipping. And then on the next parameter, we want to look at the Sigma high and low. The Sigma low are generally run up about 9.1 and the Sigma high about 5.2. And that will take out anything out of these images once it goes together. And then once you've finished with that, you end up with this image here. This is, let's say, just under an hour on this. So then we would start the processing on through the software um, in different things. And what I probably do is cover different steps as we're working through. But the idea is, is to end up with something like that out of an hour, you know, or just under an hour. Um, and then we do some different uh, topics uh, throughout the week uh, or throughout the next few style parties um, on the processing. Um, other images this week, not really that much. Um, did have a small Saturn that was just through a um, 102 mil telescope. So not bad for its size and the same conditions in the UK at the moment. We've not really had a lot of uh, clear weather. So apart from that, there's not really been much going on. And we also had an Andromeda. That was another hour out of the European Star Party as well. Oh, that's great. There were no filters on this. Um, it was quite bright moonlight as well. So on both images, there was quite bright moonlight. Um, so they're just basic processing and basic imaging. Very impressive. That's awesome. Well, Gary, I'm excited about, um, about uh, coming up to the next uh, European Star Party. We will have uh, joining us, I, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but Mike Simmons, uh, who is the founder of Astronomers Without Borders, uh, will yeah. be joining us as well. He is uh, uh, calling in uh, friends and favors to have people appear from uh, all over Europe and uh, maybe in the Middle East. And, uh, you know, we're, we're working our way down to possibly even some people in Australia. Uh, to be included in this. So that's a big swath of the planet. <laughs> it is. It, so. It's going to be fun. It'll be really interesting to get a, a different variety of people on. And, right. and that's one of the, the good things on the uh, Tuesday night shows. You're getting such a variety of people on. Um, yeah. And they're all interested. They've all got their own stories and their own uh, images and their own paths through astronomy. And that's really what it's all about. Right, right. Okay. Well, having joined us, um, uh, I'll just take a moment to recognize uh, Richard Ozer and uh, Gerald McKeague. Is that right? Yeah, McKeegan. McKeegan, sorry. Uh, uh, but uh, these guys are from Chabot Space and Science Center and the East Bay Astronomical Society out there. Um, we have a guest here, John Curie, is joining us. Uh, that's great. Um, uh, we have some people that I have not gotten to yet, which will include Ron Delbo. Um, uh, and of course, Cesar Brolo is down there in, in Argentina. 
Uh, so that's that's going to be good. And I don't know. It looks like he's working on something. So he may have a live image for us. I'm not sure. How does it look down there, Caesar? Hi, Scott. How are you? We're good. We're good. Today, today, uh, tonight, uh, we have a clear night. Incredible. Maybe it's a it's a jar pass between the clouds. And I have a hoop it there. If you'd like to see. Okay. We will come back. We will come back to you, but oh yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You you ask me when. Okay. 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 That's all right. Jupiter don't go. The Jupiter is <laughs> it's in the in the image. All right. That's awesome. Okay. All right. So uh, let's let's go. Thank you, uh, uh, Caesar and Gary. Um, uh, I wanted to bring in uh, Bob Denny uh, to talk a little bit more um, about. Uh, his experience in uh, our community, um, some of the things he's been involved with, things he's doing now. Um, Bob, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Scott. I really appreciate it. Um, I am not an astronomer. That will be my first thing. I'm an engineer, <laughs> software engineer. So mm -hmm. I try to understand uh, the best way I can describe myself is I'm the guy who designs and builds the race cars. Then I give the car to the drivers and tell them go out and win races. Yeah. So that's my thing. Right. Um, Scott and I uh, started in 2000, as I said at the beginning of the program. Um, and I should mention that among other things, I showed up at the RTMC star party in Big Bear with a telescope, a computer and some software and demonstrated automatic image acquisition and then plate solving and detection of asteroids in 2001. And um, who was that from OPT? I forgot his name. I'm very sorry, but he had a shirt on that said asteroid hunting on it. And that's where Scott and I started way back when. And we also had a huge windstorm that night, which was quite interesting with Aldo Cumulus standing lenticulars over the mountain. Yeah. It was quite a thing. So, here we are 20 years later, two things that I do. One, I have a commercial um, suite of software that you can put on your observatory and at its highest level, it runs your observatory 24 seven, hands off. Uh, and it does, it starts up, shuts down, you put your requests in, it figures out what to do and when, and you get data. So you just get data delivered in your Dropbox or whatever, Google Drive, wherever. And that's even better in a remote situation. The Great Basin Observatory being probably my favorite example of that. And actually, I should, well, I should have had that ready. Um, I didn't expect to be up right now or I would have had a picture of that. Look up Great Basin Observatory and you'll see it's the first science observatory in a national park. And it is run for the benefit of four colleges around the uh, Western US. It was done by, it was put in by a uh, combination of the colleges themselves and another group of people who pulled together and donated for that. And it's, it is in the Great Basin National Park in Eastern Nevada in a very dark sky site, not accessible to the public. No one goes into it. It is a, 27 inch plane wave inside of a, a clamshell dome and it just runs automated all night. Ha again, hands off for the benefit of college students in Nevada, Utah, uh, and Southern California. And it's quite the thing. And that, that's what I do for one side. The other side that I've done all through the 20 years that I've been doing this, 20 plus years, is promoting the idea of universal connectivity between ast astronomical devices. I could see coming into this, wanting to do software, uh, that it was a, the wild, wild west. And people were plugging different things together with different protocols and pound sign X, Y, Z, Z, Y, and all this stuff. It wasn't going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And in computing, for probably 20 years before that, we had a driver client architecture where the driver's responsible for the differences between disk drives, printers, and things like that. And then the program's right to a common interface. So I kind of took that idea and brought it into astronomy. It was a rough go for five or six years, more than a rough go. 
But I stuck with it. It came to fruition. And now the ASCOM, universal ASCOM standards are accepted. And over the last two years, a little bit more, we've taken that away outside of Windows. And instead of running through the Windows process to process or program to program communications, it now runs over a network connection using very common typical standards that everybody uses, not just astronomers, to communicate between programs and devices, including a device that can sit all by itself with a Wi-Fi connection and then be usable on all the platforms, Linux, Mac, and uh, uh, Windows. Right. So that's the Alpaca system. That's my thing that I've done more recently to help promote open and inter interconnectability in astronomy. And um, so that's kind of what I've been doing. I wish I could answer questions, but um, anyway, that that kind of in, in a short period of time tells you what I've been up to. And Scott was in on the, saw me in the beginning of all of this and right. got my little lecture back in 2000. You know what, you're gonna make this thing interchange, you know, be able to connect things. The hell with the mess. So what I do wanna do since I, again, I was a little bit unsure that I was gonna get pulled up and I wanna pull one thing up here for you to show you where to go next. And this video will change shortly, but let's see, share screen. I'm going to have a choice here, I think, of sharing that to share. And you should see now the ASCOM website, which is at, oops, I just switched it. Sorry about that. Click. Is that showing now? Are you able to see this uh, web browser with, I've got a chat yeah. Is that, it looks like it's showing. Right? Yeah, it is. It is. Okay, good. I see myself in the picture, but if right. this is showing, so this is where everything you ever wanted to know about these interchange uh, formats is. And then the alpaca part of it here and other places, I should mention, I said something during the break about um, a person we all know, Richard Berry, who kind of started the whole CCD revolution and has done so much for astronomy. Unfortunately, he lives in Eugene, Oregon. His house and barn got burned. Mm. And uh, he does have pet, well, not pet, they're actual farm animals, alpacas. They survived, which is good. But the alpaca concept here is that the name alpaca came from Richard Berry's alpacas because I was sort of enchanted by the fact that he had these things. And um, they're kind of cool animals. So uh, anyway, this is the other half of my life besides my commercial um, life, which is here. And I'm not going to spend any time on that other than to just say dc3.com is the way in. You can find out what you want to know about that whenever. And uh, that's the stuff here. So um, I wish I could show you. Can I get there from here? This is the probably the coolest thing. Uh, there it is. Okay, learn more about the Great Basin Observatory. If you want to learn more about this, there we go now. That's the, that's the facility that runs our software. And uh, you can learn all about the cooperative, the different... Um, now there's the the ribbon cutting ceremony. I should be in there. I, I have a picture of me in there, but these are the, <laughs> but these are the people. Uh, I was at that ceremony. Stevie and I were both there when this was opened, and it was just fantastic. Here are the colleges at the bottom of the screen, and uh, it, it is a real amazing thing. A guy named Paul Gardner and another guy from Pasadena put this together. It was five weeks from groundbreaking to first light, which is just amazing. That's unbelievable. A beautiful piece of engineering. And uh, we were there for the, for, the, for the first light and it was really something. So this is just one of probably a hundred plus shared observatories remotely that run autonomously 24 seven. So. Good Lord. 
that kind of pretty much I've probably chewed up enough time now on this. And uh, let me see if I can unshare my screen. Where is that? Ah, okay, stop share. There we go. Okay. Great. Thank that's you. That's what we do. Wow, that's awesome, Bob. And, you know, so many of us uh, that uh, have used ASCOM uh, and now probably be progressing to use the Alpaca platform uh, owe you a great deal of uh, gratitude. So well, thank the, you for all that hard work. The astronomers don't see it. The, the, the ideal situation is this is plumbing that enables things. And you don't, it, it, it's not something that you should see or even have to worry about. Right. So, make, it, make it all go. Universal connectivity is, is the key. That's right. I want to, I want to thank Bob personally. I've known Bob for a while now, uh, probably almost sure. 10 years. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he's helped me a lot. I, you know, I wrote, I'm, I developed, uh, or I developed the PMC 8 system and, and wrote the ASCOM driver for it. And uh, it's a, it's a very nice API. I mean, it really does a lot. And there's additions to it even today. I think uh, the latest thing I saw, um, what was the latest? Not the switch interface. It was something that came later. Oh, the weather, uh, the weather API to go out and get external weather. I just ran across that recently. That's pretty cool. I think the thing that really was probably our, uh, and I, I have to say, I do not write any software for ASCOM. That's Peter Simpson and Daniel from uh, Optech are the two lead guys. And Rick Burke is also someone who helps people unbelievably a lot. So Daniel and Peter are the key people. It's all open source. It's a project that, but I don't do any programming on ASCOM. I did it for a, 10 years. And in 2010, I kind of stepped aside and these guys are doing it now, but I'm a flag waver, you know, and what else, whatever. Uh, the thing that is, is probably worth some time to this group of people is to discuss the technology of CMOS cameras and where those things are going. It has been quite an interesting adventure. It's early technology. Uh, and Scott, if you have an opportunity to, get a couple of people who are in that business together. I will only tell you what my, I'm, I'm a, I'm kind of a futurist. Yeah. And I, I recently, the standards were revved from camera version two to camera th version three to oh. permit the, the, the camera to do the stacking internally. So you don't have to come, you don't have to download 50 humongous frames to get, and then stack them on your computer to get one 35 minute or 30 minute image. Cause the optimum exposure for the CMOS is very short. So right. it, it, what do you do? So I, I, there were a lot of people who pushed back. They said, oh, that'll never happen. They'll never stack the things. Here's all the reasons they can't do it. Well, now we have two cameras out there that stack on board, which wow. is great. So yeah. you, you, you tell it the sub-exposure interval and the final exposure interval, that change was made to the, to the uh, spec to permit that. So those are the kind of things we look at, and, and it's on a very long-term time frame because you don't want to change things quickly for that. It's a standard interface. You don't want people to go, ah, dang, just change that thing again. And nothing is ever made backwards incompatible. We never do breaking changes. So right, just right. So that's know. that's a big thing. That's a yep. yeah, backwards compatibility is a huge thing. Yep. Stuff from way back when will still run. Okay, oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. Thank you, Scott, for having me. I really appreciate it. I'll oh. stick around, though, but this is really cool. I have to tell you, I didn't know what to expect, but I'm more than pleasantly surprised. <laughs> we've, had, we've had music. We've had art. We've had yeah, you, images. Not at all. We've had ex really experienced people, people showing us how to uh, manage COVID at, at star parties. Even the people <laughs> in the chat here, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, we got to John. <laughs> Tell me how they kind of had a, uh, a, a, a secret Nebraska star party, which happened. And uh, so um, if there's a will, there's a way. You can never tell amateur astronomers they can't do something because they'll, darn it, they'll go out and do it. <laughs> and thank you, Jerry. I appreciate that. Oh, great. Thank you. 
Yeah, oh. Scott and I have talked about that a lot, that the uh, amateurs are the the pioneers in a lot of technology development. That's right. That's right. And and they always have been. And I think they always will be. Uh, so, um, you know, it's about 11 o'clock here. I'm going to have Richard Grace share some of his images. And then we're going to take a, uh, uh, a break, a question break with Terry Mann at the Astronomical League. She's going to ask question number two. She's holding herself up with... Uh, uh, how are you doing, Terry? Is everything okay? Yep, everything's fine. Okay. Doing great. All right. Okay. Hopefully everybody's su sufficiently caffeinated for this, uh, for the duration here. Uh, but we will get to everybody uh, that's that's on with us and and our and our guests here, John Curie as well. So, uh, but uh, Richard, what do you got to show us? energy drink <laughs> see here ah sharing the screen sharing the screen yeah that should be sharing whoops now richard's been on with us for many shows okay. uh and we've watched him progress as he's gone along not only uh, and he's impressed us too with some of the system integrations that he's done and uh so it's it's excellent uh to uh to watch him go thank you scott see uh here we have the uh the other night mars got very close to the moon oh yeah and uh i figured uh while i was out there while the moon was ruining the rest of the deep uh, sky objects that i would uh take this while i was there and uh, it's it's kind of underexposed, but uh, that was mainly so I could actually get Mars to look that good. Um, and it was that's just one shot, um, no stacking or anything. And uh, I was very happy with that. And let's see here, I gotta move this. Uh, you guys saw. Uh, I did the witch's broom, uh, but there was a small, why is it now working? There we go. I'll check it out. Uh, so I saw something uh, down in this area and another image that I took with the ED-80. So I went back with the Common Hunter um, just to get up in there with a little more uh, resolution. And uh, it, it didn't turn out to be what I originally thought it was, thought I might have made a discovery or something here. Yeah, right. Uh, anyway, uh, so did that and uh, very happy with the way that turned out here. And I also have been working on a a budget project. It's um, oh, that's right. <laughs> you it, it, it's it's behind me. I'll, I'll show you after the picture. Sure. Um, but I uh, got a hold of one of the first light series uh, Explore Scientific uh, 130 um millimeter newtonians that's uh they're i think they're only 150 dollars um and i figured i would see what i could do with that and honestly all of everything went wrong for me uh last night <laughs> but uh i managed to get a up in andromeda with some pretty decent resolution um considering everything that went the way that it did i got a little dark corner here uh some things need to be done when i got the scope Mm -hmm. I, I laser collimated it, but uh, then I found out that the threads on the focuser were uh, not the correct size for uh, attaching my camera. So I got some JB Weld and an M42 thread thing, and I JB welded it on there. And uh, I took the whole scope apart, and I cut the back half of the focuser out of it to decrease some vignetting and some other things. I don't think you want it back anymore. Uh, we'll talk about that. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <sorry. laughs> but uh, Frame it, though. I, I might put it up in our, our uh, Hall of Fame here. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, I also had, uh, let's see, this is the, the only picture, but I had so much trouble last night because I just installed ASCOM for the first time. So I was re remote controlling my mount separately for the first time with a new scope that had a, uh, a slight cone error. So while I was trying to do this before the moon came up, I ended up shooting M110 for about two hours while I was watching the Clear Skies Network, not paying attention. 
uh so i only ended up getting a little bit of data after the moon was up and bright and some stuff and uh the, the scope's a little powerful for andromeda anyway but uh it's it's what i got for the moment and i wanted to show that and uh let's see here let me stop sharing where is it there it is okay so we stop sharing but okay probably don't end up seeing something like that wow on, on a first light scope with a filter drawer with a filter in it that costs more than the scope and <laughs> you know but uh it, it did a nice job and i plan to use it some more in the, uh, yeah uh, please do please do. In yeah. the coming soon we'll we'll get some uh, much better shots out of it so some of the backstory on this i think you were a little bit inspired by caesar brollo who was uh talking about optimizing some less expensive newtonians um uh or uh yeah what, what do you have like the little uh um you have a lo little logo on your on your uh very cool very awesome that's, that's, that's right. asteroid hunters logo we've been sneaking that in there uh, everywhere we can that's very cool well um, oh, hey yeah, scott the uh the power the the price point on that telescope is 150 dollars 150 and that's what that's what uh richard grace said so yeah yeah, yeah so yeah, there's uh, there's adapters that cost one hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, so <laughs> to get a whole telescope to do some imaging with, that's fantastic. And Caesar, thanks for also being part of the inspiration for that. Yeah, I'll have a much better night. Uh, originally, it came the inspiration came from. Um, oh gosh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's in, uh, in oh, the UK as well. That's uh, but, right, uh, Astro Biscuit. Yeah. There you go, Astro Biscuit. Yeah, uh, I saw one of his, uh, a couple of his actually. One he got like two different Newtonians and cut one down because you know the old ones are longer and you couldn't put a camera on them and get the back focus and blah blah blah. And yeah, this is really cool. So I kind of wanted to do something like that. And uh, a small newt's so much easier on, on the budget, especially if you're doing stuff with a color cam. You know, yeah, uh, it just makes sense. And you know, amount is. <laughs> so much more important than the telescope i mean to, to oh, yeah. get in there i mean i can't emphasize that enough to anybody who's starting out that you know i i started out and i was like you know we'll we'll get a few hundred dollar scope and a you know a few hundred dollar mount and you know that that was not the way to do it you know uh, spending a few more dollars on the on the mountain you, you can get away with a, a lot less scope and as long as your mount can point it in the right place yep that's right that's right that's awesome, Richard. Thank you. Um, no problem. Uh, we're going to uh, we're going to go back to Terry Mann in the Astronomical League. Uh, she's going to ask question number two. Now, we um, uh, uh, we did not uh, say what the door prize is going to be, um, but uh, we had offered uh, some door prizes, which would have included the choice of a fifty-two degree eyepiece. Um, uh, a Galileo scope, and uh, and then also an AR-102, uh, Explore Scientific Acrobat, okay? So what is this, what, what was the, uh, Terry, what was the first door prize going to be? Um, and then what will the second door prize be? Uh, Scott, take your choice, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I had like a bottle I could spend or something. <laughs> We'll do it in order. Okay, we uh, last time we did um, the IP, so that'll be for question number one, which you, which you read off, and then um, question number two will be for the world famous Galileo scope, which Gary Palmer can attest is an excellent astrograph for imaging the moon. Okay, so he stuck a I don't know, fifteen hundred dollars uh, CMOS camera on it and made a beautiful image of the moon and image processed it for us as well on the air. So that was really cool. Um, the Galileo. Scope. You'll have to show that again, Scott, because we didn't yeah. see it. Oh yeah. Well, uh, Gary wants to uh, come back on with Tyler here in a moment, um, which we'll do. But we still have to get through to uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center with Richard and uh, and um, uh, Gerald uh, to uh, show what that 36 inch is all about. And then we're going to go over to Caesar in Argentina because I know it's getting late, okay? And he's got a live image of Jupiter that he wants to show us. And so what is question number two? All right, question number two. And again, you'll need to look on the Astronomical League Facebook page. What city and state will the next Astronomical League conference, which is called ALCON, take place? 
Whoa, okay. So remember, send your questions. Don't answer it in chat. Send your question, your answers to your questions to Kent at explorescientific.com. There you go. And Kent will take those answers and ship them off to the Astronomical League officers and they will verify who is the first to answer that correctly and then they will notify you. So you'll get this beautiful, uh, I think it's on Astronomical League letterhead and email. No, it's just an email, I suppose, but an official email from the Astronomical League and they will announce that uh, you are the lucky winner and um, and then uh, uh, send that information back over to us and we'll ship you that door prize wherever you are, anywhere in the world. So, um, but that's great. Uh, thank you, Terry. We are going to jump to our second break. You get 10 minutes, uh, grab a sandwich, a Coke, an energy drink, a cup of coffee, or maybe something stronger if you need it. Um, and uh, we'll be back in, in a few minutes here. Well, I think it's going to be sooner than 10 minutes here. <laughs> Somehow I've messed this up. How could I mess it up? I don't know. I see. I have no idea. I see Terry Mann on the. There we go. That, that'll give us a 10 minute break. And let me share my screen. And there we go. There we go. We got 10 minutes, folks. Okay. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome. I need some uh, something to wet my whistle here. So, Scott, I don't know if you saw in the chat that John Curry's with us. So he's not a lurker. He's not a Zoom bomber. Oh, he's not. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. You don't have to worry. Then we go. Well, me, well, actually, you might have to worry, but we'll we'll try to keep them under control. Okay. Yeah, I know astronomers are so wild. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And people are anxious to hear who are the last door prize winners. So we'll I'll uh, light a. Um, I'll get Kent to um, get us those answers. Well, for all of you folks who are not on the West Coast, count your blessings. How's it going over there, Richard? It is horrible today. We couldn't even see the sun. Here, through Lord. the smoke it was just smoke so that's why we can't open our dome tonight because ash and optics don't mix well yeah that's what i hear unless you really got to scour something I mean, you might want to i mean if, you, if you're going to clean it you might as well <laughs> Can use a rotary sander to clean it. Oh God! <laughs> How is your your sky there? No, there's no sky. All there is is smoke. There's smoke and fire. The entire oh, state what? is on fire. Here we have a fire. 
uh, in the area of Delta at maybe 300 kilometers. And we had the, the entire winter, a lot of uh, dry time and dry weather, sorry. And we have a huge, huge fires. And every night we had small in the sky. It was terrible. And I don't know why I am lucky today because the, the quantity of smoke is uh, um, acceptable, the level is- Well, I had no idea you were suffering through the same thing. And uh, No, no, yes, that. unfortunately, for, sorry, fortunately now uh, the, the fires in, in this area uh, are finished, finished. So, Good. Uh, I think right. ours are just. I think ours are just getting going. Uh, sorry. Usually, I, I, you, usually, our fire season hits its peak in uh, um, in, in September, October, and this has been going since uh, mm. late July. Yes. Yes, I, I, I saw in the news that it was terrible. Uh, you are in California. Yes. 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 You're in the Bay Area, right? Yeah, we're in the Bay Area. Oh, yes, yes. Horrible, horrible. Yeah, I'm getting some of it down here in Southern California. Oh, uh, no doubt. I, yeah, in, in the morning, there's ash all over my backyard. That's why I didn't set up today. And you well, can't see anything anyway. The sky's all smoky. Well, we just we just took a peek outside and we're able to see a few things, but you know, opening the dome under these conditions or opening the uh, the roof under these conditions is just a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Jupiter looks like Mars. <laughs> if you like, I, I can show you. I... Everything looks like Mars. Yeah. It's like Mars. With, uh, with Jupiter, if you like, Scott. Yes. Let me show. Ah, no, 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 I'm sorry, not, not because the, we are, uh, Scott are sharing the screen to see, to, to watch the, no, no, no. Oh, we gotta, we gotta wait. No, 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 don't yeah. touch anything. <laughs> don't touch anything, yeah. I can, it'll, no, it'll, it'll no, mess no. him up. <laughs> no, yes. I, it won't be the first time I've been messed up. <laughs> we, need to, we, we need to be, uh, uh, be the students where the professor are, uh, go to the classroom. But it's fun. I love it. Uh, oh, but I have I have a uh, Jupiter. They, they can hear us uh, as we're on break here. Uh, it's nice. A person that goes by Cel Celtic Rav Ravenia. Okay. Uh, at Celtic, or I don't know how to pronounce it actually. I'm very new to all this. Millions actually. Okay, I bought a Mead LX90 in February, uh, then went on lockdown. So Skyview parties have been canceled since. Insert sad face here, but I'm still trying to learn. But we also have had such bad weather here. Nothing like the fires and smoke though. Well, uh, that's why we have, have these global star parties. So you can join in and uh, get that star party experience. Uh, we have a lot of people just listen to it. If they have clear skies, They'll listen to it while they're out observing. So it does, it does uh, bring the star party to your backyard. Uh, yes, it's okay. Greg Raven. Raven. Thank Raven. you. <laughs> I couldn't pronounce it right. Uh, Maxi says hi everyone. Greetings from Argentina. Hola, Cesar. Hola to you too. Who's talking about Argentina? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. All right. We got a couple. I, I have the, the Yexus 100 working here. Yeah. I'm still working. <laughs> working. That's great. I took pictures. Yes. Yes. I, I took some pictures of uh, 15, 15, 15 seconds exposure with a camera over the mount and uh, with a 135 millimeters uh, focus with a Canon and work it. And 
I, I, I was a little coward to say, okay, no more than 50 minutes because I don't, I don't was guiding or I don't was really sure about my, my uh, uh, equatorial uh, nation. And really, if, if I left 30 seconds, I think that the, the stars still be around. Very interesting, really. Right. It is a small mount for, for the balcony. It's, it's excellent. I love it. Okay. Well, I think everybody here is ready to get back on, so I'm going to stop sharing. And we are going to go back to gallery view here. And um, uh, where did we leave off here? Um, I said, after Richard Grace, we would have. <laughs> I've lost my way here a little bit. <laughs> Wait, you said you were going to. I was going to go to Ron Delvo. OK. Yeah. Here's some images, right? And, and, then, and then to us at Chabot, yeah. Both of you. So, Ron, what do you got for us? You got the stage now. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Now, you're in Arizona in some pretty dark skies out there, right? Yeah, we have... Um, uh, I thought I unmuted myself there. Can you hear? Yep. Okay. I live in uh, Fountain Hills, Arizona. I have um, a whole bunch of scopes. This little Ramada I had, I built the sides on it and uh, made it so I can store my scopes in there. There are times when I can put my scopes out and have it up for, have them up for days, you know, because we have consecutive clear skies. And I'll have uh, my LX200 doing the work of, uh, taking data and then I can go observe with my Newtonians or whatever. Uh, let's see. Uh, all of a sudden, <laughs> you don't know what to do. Let's see. Um, hey, Ron, that looks like a, a putt putt green hazard. Yeah, it's, it's a golf green. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever, do you ever shoot between the legs? <laughs> I, I have golf clubs, but I don't even mess with it. You know, um, we got it. I thought, well, I'll put my scopes on it and <laughs> never thinking I'd do anything else with it. Now here's uh here's the smoke we have currently over the area. That's why I'm not observing tonight. I'm in the blue dot. Oh boy. Look at it all. Look at all the fires in Arizona too. Yeah. Everywhere. Yep. California's lit up. And then... Uh, and we're getting some of that smoke all the way out here into Arkansas as well. Yeah. See, that was the moon this morning at about 4.40 in the morning. And it was still a little bit dark, but uh, it was orange. And uh, opposition for Mars is coming on October 13th. I put that little information there. This is my uh, website also or my facebook uh, observatory page here's uh mars um i got some detail from my uh, eight inch cave and uh, i take about i take about um 50 500 frames and uh, of those 200 i stack in registack six and sometimes i use auto stacker to um, stack them and basically, uh, there's another view. I got some detail. This is what it looked like uh, when I took the data. Okay. Not too bad. You can see detail there. That's a Cameron for, uh, Canon 40D. I have uh, a modded Canon camera and uh, a regular everyday one that I got cheap. And um, that's what I used to take my pictures with. And uh, 
I just go ahead and put this one came out pretty good. Yeah. Uh, took pictures of the moon. I took a lot of nature pictures. That's my, uh, I, this telescope I got free. Uh, a guy on uh, uh, Craigslist uh, said it was a 12 inch and he wanted to just sell it for 50 bucks because it had been in storage for 30 years. Oh my goodness. And he said, uh, when I went there, I had my $50 <laughs> and it was an eight inch. I was a little <laughs> saddened, but it was in beautiful shape. And uh, he said, I don't want money for it. You take it. If you're going to fix it up and use it, you can have it. So wow. I was given that. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, well, I take, you know, pictures of the planets, moon. Um, I do a lot of... Uh, Outreach. This is uh, our Neowise shot from the LX200, yep. and this is uh, an asteroid called Delvo 1848. Oh. And uh, it's a stony asteroid. They um, got this shape from uh, you know occultations, many occultations, and came up with the shape of it. I well, thought that was neat. Wow. You know, if you uh, if you go and and go on Wiki um, and look up your name for an asteroid, you'll probably find it because there's hundreds of thousands of them. Well, Scott can find his name for sure. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> <laughs> I run across this, which is pretty cool. It's a uh, very expensive way to look at the night sky through a telescope. It's an image intensifier. And it's the latest generation, and it's like oh, a right. five thousand dollar outfit. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, um, you give a boost yeah. to the uh, visual view. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, this is a raw image um, video, and uh, it's pretty steady. And not bad at all. You can see there's actually two moons there, but um, mm -hmm. I'll take, like I say, 500. You know, I'm, I'm just a regular guy. I love astronomy. A lot of times I'll, I'll have an, uh, a night where I, um, I have a refractor night and I just do refractors. And uh, I have people over sometimes and uh, I show them how to find the North Star, uh, point out the planets, do some observing, depending if the moon's out or not. Um, it's mostly um, star clusters, a couple of galaxies. Uh, if um, M42's out, they're flipped out about that. Uh, seeing the moon, uh, Saturn is what gets people excited. And um, I have the space. We. Uh, the East Valley astronomers meet uh, downtown in Fountain Hills, and we have a, um, a um, uh, gathering, like a star party. And yeah. we, go, we go ahead and um, have the public walk through between all the scopes, and we show them different things. Uh, we'll find if there's um, one of the brighter asteroids out, if there's a comet out, if there's – and, and uh, our um, – Fountain Hills is a dark sky community, by the way, uh, about two years old. And I did this one night. It's a uh, comet made from salt on the table. <laughs> you just sprinkle salt on a black table and it looks like a comet. That's about it, guys. All this, right. is, this is my picture of uh, when I first got my scope, I took this picture couldn't understand why I couldn't get the whole thing in the view. And I understand now that um, it's four moons wide. And uh, you, know, you, you know why. It, the field of view is small. So that's it, guys. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. I have, um, I have, here's the groups I have. I have a Cave Astrola group on Facebook. I have uh, Amateur yeah that's that's a uh, star charts mm -hmm. i have uh i wrote them down uh visual astronomy 
grayscale astrophotography, single frame astrophotography, uh, amateur astro amateur astronomers telescope hardware, and the sky uh, the sky tonight. So I have all those different uh, groups that I you know admit people in and try and make sure that people don't go crazy posting bad things. <laughs> <laughs> One Modern of them. The, uh, the um, uh, hardware group has about 6,000 people in it. And, and, you know, I just started the page thinking it'd be cool to have that, you know. Sure. And, um, you get to learn a lot of stuff. People post things. They have problems. You talk about it. Kind of like uh, when we had our other star party I was involved with, um, everybody kind of joined in and was, uh, you know, giving tips to each other. And that's just what's really cool about having a bunch of guys that are um, experienced, have done, um, you know, astronomy for a long while and know what they're doing. It's always a cool thing. So that's it, guys. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Ron. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Well, up next, uh, we promised that we would have uh, 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 the 36 telescope from Chabot Space and Science Center uh, uh, showing up. So, uh, Richard, I'm going to give you the stage here, I think. I, sure, yeah, I'm right here. You're right there. Should I keep <laughs> this in grid mode or should I, um, so that we can see everyone? Uh, you've got... Um, I've got Gerald McKeegan here and I've got John Curry here as well. So, um, we could do grid mode. We're going to be doing a bunch of sharing, so uh, it really doesn't matter which format you choose. Can, uh, take over. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So I don't know how many people have heard of the Chabot Space and Science Center. Uh, we are uh, an observatory and science center in the Oakland Hills in the Bay Area of California. Right now, I'm calling us the California Nebula because there is uh, nothing but smoke. And we unfortunately can't open the roof of our observatory tonight because there's too much ash and we wouldn't see much uh, even if we could open it. Um, the conditions are absolutely horrendous here. But uh, we thought we can join in, tell you a little bit about our institution, show you what we're trying to do. Um, with COVID, we had the challenge of figuring out how to continue our outreach activities to the community and, uh, and to the, you know, the region in general. Uh, people come from a long ways to see our telescopes. We've got this 36-inch research uh, reflecting telescope that's behind me. Uh, we have a 20-inch Brashear refractor uh, built at the turn of the century, not this century, but the last century. And we have an 8-inch Alvin Clark instrument as well. Uh, the Alvin Clark and the uh, Brashear uh, are both, um, uh, it's written into the charter that those have to be open to the public every every week uh, oh. as a public observatory. And uh, our 36 inch here was built uh, uh, 20 years ago. Um, and we follow the same um, uh, spirit of that uh, with this telescope. And it's used all, you know, mostly as a visual instrument and as a research instrument. And uh, with the inability to have the public come to the center, we had to figure out very quickly what we could do to continue using it and to continue uh, keeping the public engaged. And so we decided to go with the one shot uh, astrophotography method. Uh, I'm actually going to change my screen here. And this is all I could use SharpCap for tonight, folks, is... Uh... Oh, so you're actually <laughs> at the observatory. This oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're here live. Sort of green screen type of thing, right? This is yeah, no, this is the real thing. I'll get up here and I'll I can actually uh, wow touch it. <laughs> so, so it's real. Good um, green screen right there, dude. You, you can see Gerald there in the very back corner. Wave, Gerald. Yeah, there he is. Yeah, and uh, and there's John, and you can see we're safely socially distanced from one another, um, and what we do is every Saturday night. I take this simple Canon T1i DSLR camera, okay. hook it up to the uh, hook it up to the focuser, and we use backyard EOS, and we do single shot astrophotography. And with a 36 inch aperture, it's amazing what you can get in 
you know, either live view or at most 30 seconds of exposure. Without, we don't have to spend any time with processing, stacking, technical issues, just aim the telescope and take a picture and tell somebody, to tell somebody, tell the public what it is we're looking at. And I'll show you some examples of what we've been able to do. Um, nowhere near as impressive, of course, as the processed images that you guys have been showing, which have been beautiful, by the way. Uh, but, you know, when we do a tour of the moon, this is the type of view we'll get. We have the, uh, you can see that's our field of view with the DSLR. Uh, it also, you know, we need a big, we need a big sensor for this telescope. This is a long focal length. And, uh, you know, we're never able to see the entirety of the moon, of course. Uh, but uh, Gerald here, who has uh, quite a bit of expertise on lunar geology, is able to give these really great tours of individual features on the moon. He, he knows every, every single crater on the moon by heart. <laughs> 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 and so, um, you know, so, so Gerald is able to lead that activity. Um, this was a quick shot we did of the blue snowball a couple of weeks ago. Cool. Um, this is M15. Uh, we teach people about globular clusters. Um, and this was M57 that we took uh, this is last week or the week before last. And you can see we get a lot, you know, it, it's a 30 second image and I got the red and the blue and the central star and it fills up, you know, so people are pretty excited about this, even though it's a noisy image and it would be nice to have, you know, three hours of data on the 36 inch. Um, that's not what our objective is. So that's kind of the MO here, you know, and, you know, Saturn, Jupiter. Um, and uh, on, a, on a decent night, we can get pretty good views. You can see the Cassini division, see the red spot, you can overexpose it and show the moons if we want to. Um, and that's kind of what we do. And what I'll do is uh, actually, I'm going to turn it over to Gerald, who has, uh, if I can find my controls here. You were able to see me switch these photos, right? Yeah. Okay. I got to figure out how to get back to the Zoom. Here we go. Stop share. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm seeing Ron though. <laughs> Scotty, okay, take, now you're saying... take me off, Scotty. Yeah, yeah, so you should be able to share your screen now, uh, Gerald. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I wanted to do is just kind of give you a little tour of the telescope and, and kind of review some of the things that uh, Richard talked about and also talk about uh, one of the, uh, the science projects that we do here. So I'm going to share my screen here, uh, I think. Scott, can you take the yellow off of me? Yeah, yeah. Hold on. Let's. I mean, uh, you like looking at me and everything, but. Pull the spotlight. <laughs> we're, you know, we were, we're entertained. <laughs> I don't know, you know. <laughs> there we go. All right, so there we go. Okay, so uh, this is a, a night view of the Chabot Space and Science Center. This was actually taken not long after we opened uh, in the year 2000 at this location. Uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center has actually been at three different locations. <clears throat> it was originally built uh, as the Oakland Observatory in what is now downtown Oakland, California. Uh, that was in 1883. Oh, wow. And then in 1915, it moved away from downtown Oakland to what they thought at the time was a good location because it was away from the city lights. Uh, but that location turned out to be right on the Hayward earthquake fault. So, oh. so um, after uh, going round and round for literally decades, they eventually moved the Chabot Space and Science Center to the current location, which is in uh, Oakland, in the hills above Oakland. So let me see if I get it. There's a, an aerial view of it. You see the center there in the foreground and off in the distance, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but this is downtown Oakland down here. And we are now up in the hills on the Eastern edge of Oakland. In fact, we are right at the city limit. The, the city limit literally runs right along this line here. Uh, so we are as high and as far as we can get uh, from the city of Oakland and still be in the city of Oakland. As you can tell from those photos, we have no problem with light pollution whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Yeah, we are in the middle of a park, but believe me, there's a lot of light pollution all around us, so it is quite a quite a problem. So if that if that's Oakland, um, that bridge going across is that the one that collapsed when the earthquake? This hit? one right here, yes, that's that's the one that collapsed during the uh, 1989 earthquake. Wow. So this this is the San Francisco Bay Bridge. This is Treasure. Actually, this is Yerba Buena Island, and this is Treasure Island. And then there's the rest of the Bay Bridge going across to San Francisco. Uh, here's the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. Um, so a little tour of the Bay Area there. So uh, if you look at the facility, you see in this end of the facility, uh, this is where our observatory complex is. And we have three observatories. Uh, not sure how well you can see all three of them here. The two domes house our antique uh, classical uh, refracting telescopes, the ones that Richard was talking about. In the small dome is the eight inch Alvin Clark uh, telescope, uh, which was built in 1883 and is, in still, is still in operation. Uh, we use it every weekend or we were using it every weekend for our public viewing programs. And the big dome is the 20 inch telescope uh, built by Warner Swayze with optics by John Bashir, mm. Brashier. Um, and it was built in 1915. And then over here in the corner is the one we want to talk about tonight. It's kind of hard to see because it's a different kind of building. Uh, instead of a dome, we have a roll off roof observatory. And you see the telescope sticking up right there. Um, there's a couple shots of the telescope in action. Oh. Uh, this is a 36 inch uh, Cassegrain reflector. It is a true Cassegrain. Um, and it is on a mount uh, that was built mostly by DFM engineering. Um, but the telescope itself was designed by an, an engineer here, which some of you may know, uh, Kevin Medlock. And Kevin designed the telescope and he did a lot of the fabrication of the telescope itself. Uh, and then he worked with DFM engineering to do the mount and then the control software for controlling the uh, telescope is all DFM engineering uh, software. God, you might remember when uh, you were at uh, Big Bear. You know, I think you took the tour to the Big Bear Solar Observatory. DFM also did that mount. Yes, they, they, did. they look very similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have two uh, five-inch uh, DNG uh, refractors that we use as finder scopes. Um, and if we're imaging or something like that, we'll put a, an eyepiece on those so we can see where we're looking. Um, and we use these telescopes primarily for public viewing. Uh, back in the pre-pandemic days, we opened every Friday and Saturday night uh, to the public. Uh, for free telescope viewing. Uh, all three telescopes will be open and we have a big uh, observatory deck out in front and there would usually be three or four amateurs uh, with their smaller telescopes out there as well. And that was free. We ran it from 7.30 to 10.30 every night. Uh, and it was not unusual for us to get 150, 200 people or more uh, coming up to Chabot every Friday and Saturday night to look through our telescopes. Um, so public observing and uh, education is our primary goal here. Uh, we do some astrophotography. Uh, it's not a major emphasis here. Uh, it's a good, really good scope for doing astrophotography, but uh, because we're doing so much of our education work up here, uh, only a couple of people actually get on the telescope and do some serious astrophotography work. Now, in addition to the public observing and the education programs, we do a little bit of science here. Sounds like several of you are into asteroid hunting, and so are we. So we do uh, asteroid observation here, near-Earth asteroid observation, primarily confirmation and follow-up on new uh, uh, discoveries of uh, near-Earth objects. And so we're looking for astrometry, the position data, and right ascension, declination, the timing of the, the, the observations, and then the photometry. And it sounds like most of you are probably familiar with this, so I won't bore you with too much with it, but this is how we do it. We take three or four images of the same part of the sky. 
Uh, our field of view for this telescope is pretty small. Uh, with the camera on it, it's only about uh, 12 arc minutes wide. So we don't see a lot of the sky. So our pointing is pretty critical. Um, and so we, you know, we get four images like this, same part of the sky. For those of you who are sharp, sharp eyed asteroid hunters, I'm sure you've already found the asteroid, right? Um, but uh, you know, the, the typical processing uh, sequence is to uh, 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 plates all the, the images, uh, matching it to some standard catalog, such as UCAC4. Uh, recently, we're using Gaia. Um, plate solve it, uh, which is, as I think most of you know, is a way of matching the pixel position to the RA declination coordinates. You come up with an equation. Uh, for us, it's a second order equation that matches the pixels and the, uh, the, the RA and declination coordinates. Once we do that, then we just blink through the images and sure enough, there's the asteroid. And you know, the, if you can't find it this way, you can always look for the blue arrow in the sky and that way you'll know where the asteroid is. So. Hey, Gerald, I got a question. Do you, do you use Astrometrica? I've used Astrometrica for quite yeah, a long time. Yeah, we, we use Astrometrica to do this. So, so once, once we've identified that there actually is an asteroid in each of the images, then we go back to the each individual frame. Uh, we've identified where the asteroid is in each frame. And then we use Astrometrica uh, software to uh, get some data on it. And, uh, you know, the Astrometrica not only uh, gives us the data we're looking for there, you see it in the red box, but it also gives us some sense of the quality of the image, uh, the uh, you know, signal and noise ratio and so forth, uh, which helps us distinguish between real asteroids and cosmic ray strikes and hot pixels and so forth. Um, so once we get all this data, we put it into an email that is uh, sent to the International Astronomical Union's Minor Planet Center. They combine our data with data from other observatories around the world and uh, calculate the orbit for the asteroid. If it's a newly discovered asteroid, eventually they will assign a provisional designation to that asteroid. And away we go. So what is your, what is your observatory code? Richard? It's G58. G58, okay. Yeah, G58 is the our, observatory code. The Mark Slade Remote Observatory, our observatory is Whiskey 54. Yeah, so so Jerry, for those people who don't know what an observatory code is, why don't you just give it a little... Definition? Okay, and, and it's Gerald, not Jerry. Yeah, I've been, been known to kill people who call me Jerry, so... I think he was talking to me, Gerald. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay, sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to kill Scott. But I understand. I said I said it's a three-way duel starting here. Uh. <laughs> so so anyway, uh, for those of you who are interested in doing asteroid work, or there's a few other science projects that you can get them involved with, the International Astronomical Union assigns you an, an a, a observatory code. That code tells them your exact location, your, your geographic location, and also your altitude above sea level, which is then used to make the calculations of the orbit uh, based on the data that you submit. Uh, there is a process that you have to go through in order to qualify for that observatory code. You have to submit data and demonstrate that you're able to uh, produce data that's reasonably good quality. And once you do that, then they will assign you an observatory code. And there are actually probably four or 500 observatories around the world that have observatory codes. Not all of them do asteroid work. Uh, some of those codes are actually pretty old and refer to observatories that aren't functioning anymore. Uh, but there's probably a good 300 observatories around the world that participate to some extent or another in the asteroid uh, observing program. Miss, Mr. McKeegan. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'll just use the Ger safe Ger word. Gerald is fine. <laughs> <laughs> so they can, just from that little streak, they can figure the orbit of the uh, asteroid? Yeah, you can actually figure uh, an, an orbit with just three data points uh, uh, that are roughly 10 arc seconds or more apart. 
uh, you can compute an orbit. Now, that orbit will not be a very accurate orbit, but it will be a good enough approximation that you can predict an hour or even several hours from now where the asteroid will be. Uh, but to get a, a good solid orbit that's reliable, you know, years in advance, you need many, many nights of observations. Uh, so when we talk about confirmation and follow-up, uh, when, when an asteroid or a potential asteroid is first spotted by one of the survey telescopes, such as the ones at Mount Lemmon or PanStars, um, it goes on to a website at the Minor Planet Center called the uh, NEO confirmation page. Uh, and that's just, it just says, hey, these guys spotted something. It's maybe an asteroid, maybe not. You then go and you observe where they predict it will be. And if you can confirm the existence, that's a confirmation observation. That you then do follow-up observations over a few days uh, until the Minor Planet Center gets enough data that they can uh, make a reasonable uh, uh, determination of the orbit, and then they will assign a provisional designation to it. So when you hear about asteroid, you know, 2020 uh, PL2 or something like that, that's the provisional designation that's assigned by the Minor Planet Center, but they don't do that until they have enough data. Uh, you then have to continue observing it. Unfortunately, you only get very short observing windows. Uh, if you can observe it over a two-week period, that's pretty good. Most of the time, it's only a period of about five or six days. And then you have to wait years, sometimes several years, before you can observe it again. So uh, it's a long process before okay. you finally uh, get to where you actually get to name the asteroid. So it can be years, if ever, where they eventually name the asteroid. So anyway, uh, you know, this is this is the science we do here at Chabot. Um, we are currently, um, because of the pandemic, unable to do public viewing. Uh, so we're just doing the virtual uh, telescope program every Saturday night that Richard mentioned uh, for Chabot members and, and the public. Uh, we open uh, or, or put a camera on the telescope and let people see what we would see. But someday we hope to get finally get back to where we have lines of people at the telescope uh, and don't have to worry about social distancing and all that. Get back to letting the public get up to the telescope because they really enjoy it. That's great. That's great. I'm going to interrupt here because we're about to lose Jupiter in Argentina. Oh, so yeah. Let's uh, switch over to Caesar and uh, he can show us what, uh, what he's got going on there. Yes. Thanks, Caesar. Thank you for uh, uh, bringing us this live stream. Oh, uh, yes. No, nothing. Yes. You can see. You, you can see Scott and everyone. Oh, yeah. Peter? Yes. OK. The problem is that we have something of uh, cloud. A small layer of clouds, and we are losing behind a building in many, in maybe one minute. And uh, the problem with the layers uh, of, of clouds is really uh, noisy. The image is really noisy and um, and dark. And I using the all all the, the old game that I have my camera. I'm using this uh, four inches telescope Maxutov design and using a three uh, times barrel um barrel uh when well, extender well. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can, can, can you help me scott because that explore scientific product and a, a camera with a um two megapixels uh but the, you know the problem is that Maybe I can take, I can, today we had, fortunately, I took uh, some, some uh, videos, but with a much better quality than now, I put a, a shorter poster and the, the gang is, it's all, all 
totally because the problem is now the, the la layer of, of clouds that we have we have now in the in the in the night. But uh, I have I, I took um, videos tonight where is the quality is 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 really is really it's it's good. It's maybe maybe not excellent. Uh, you know, between the uh, buildings, you have a local scene conditions that uh, have a problem that maybe you can see uh, how how uh, is moving the planet now because it's really really near to uh, to a building. Maybe in a few minutes can be disappear. Well, um, after to to watch a. a, a a wonderful uh, observatory that Gerald showed us of 36 inches. This is, is a, 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 only four inches, <laughs> maybe, okay. But it's like, you know. <laughs> is the red today, spot out? Was, was, today was interested, if, if you like to, I can, I can watch you, the, uh, yes. Yes, it's, it's behind the, the wheel. Who, who there is any more? It's any longer more to to unable to 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 be watched because now it's loosened by 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 the because it's behind the the another tower. I see. Near to my home, yes. But I have I have a very interesting video of today while we were talking. Uh, the first one, let me, it's very interesting because <clears throat> here you have the, the um, transit of, uh, I think that it was Gaminades. Let me check. Yes. Gaminides was maybe let me check if it's if, if it's clear. Maybe in this area you can see this. You can see this. Oh, it's still on the uh, sharp cap. Yes, it's maybe with fourteen minutes of difference between the, the program and and the real time of the capture. All, all uh, of satellites of uh, Jupiter uh, are interesting to, to, ta to take the time uh, between the, the, the programs, of Stellarium programs and the real capture because it's how, how the light was uh, was a measure the velocity of the light. This is very, this is very interesting. And let me check. But yes, was Gaminides when we start the third party? Uh, was Gaminides that we was don't not not an a transit, if not an occultation? Yeah, Caesar, we don't see any image coming over. Ah, sorry. Let me check. Sorry. Okay. It's okay. Well, oh, yes. I, I don't know what. Here we go. Oh, there's some. Oh, oh. Nice. Okay. You can see now. No. Yes. We see several images of Jupiter. Uh, okay. Okay. We can. Let 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 me know if. Uh, because it ha have some delay of time when yes when the the, the video start here there. here maybe I here is gonna this is going out from from the occultation. And the time, 
between the 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 app of the cell phone, like a Stellarium app application, uh, was uh, 14, 14, 14 uh, minutes of delay. Still very close. Yes. Was very interesting. And another thing was that I, I yesterday I I tried to talk to talk sorry to to um, I, I try to not really try I I have a saxophone with this I have to use this little mount to 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 make a a, a, a try to try so. Sorry, by my computer where I have, uh, yes, here. Eight, seven. For M8, I, I could uh, uh, take a picture of uh, 50 minutes without, gui without guidance. Sorry, the, here the light pollution is bottle nine, maybe. But despite the quality of the objective the, uh, that is not so good, the stars was point pointed uh, with a mount that is really, uh, really excellent for a balcony in the EXOS uh, 100 work properly um, I use it no more than uh, 15 minutes each uh, each uh, picture, but work really pr properly uh, um, in in each uh, picture. And I found that if I if uh, I was uh, I was chosen uh, instead of 15 minutes, uh, 30 minutes, uh, it was uh, work properly too. And this was very interesting. I'm processing, I'll processing for tomorrow this picture and I'll, I'll share in, in uh, my Facebook maybe. Okay, this is all <laughs> from Argentina. Well, thank you. From my balcony. <laughs> <laughs> from my balcony. Yes. Well, that's awesome. You know, there's a lot of balcony astronomy, great astronomy done from balconies from around the world. You know, I know that uh, Don Parker, who is an incredible uh, planetary imager, worked from his ba balcony. I think Damian Peach also has worked uh, a lot from his balcony as well. Um, I can think of a few others. But, uh, you know, the main point is, is that no matter where you are, okay, you, you should be getting that telescope out and using it. So uh, Caesar's in uh, Buenos Aires, uh, you know, it is a, um, it is a, uh, a big city, uh, lots of light pollution, but uh, he gets some amazing images from there. And he is always, uh, he's always doing astronomy and sharing the astronomy experience down there in South America. He also is, will be leading uh, the eclipse expedition um, or, or one of the leaders of the eclipse expedition that will happen this December, total eclipse of the sun uh, in Patagonia. So that's, uh, that's a great thing. And uh, hopefully, hopefully that uh, comes off successful for you. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We hope that maybe a miracle that. Right. We, we, we can do it maybe. Yes. I think that. Yeah, I hope so. I hope it, so. Now is it's a hard moment. Now actually is is maybe the, the hardest uh, the hardest time for for the pandemic here. But uh, maybe it will be uh, you know a peak where we can see the light. Maybe up to in the end of the tunnel we say. Uh, maybe in two weeks more. But December is every time more <laughs> near to us. And of course that uh, we are a little worried about this. 
but you know, in, in while uh, uh, we are we are enjoying astronomy from the balcony, from the backyards, you know, it's it's, it's a time to to share pictures of the sky and talk in, in a virtual star parties like like this like now. That's it's a great experience. Yeah, this is the only way to do a global star party. <laughs> A really an, an honor to, to share small image on this uh, with a, an excellent group that I I learned a lot tonight. Oh. Travel people, really. Thank you, Caesar. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, welcome. You're welcome, Scott. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. You you've been I think on every one of our star parties, so I really appreciate that. It's great to have. Uh, Southern Hemisphere view, you know, and perspective of astronomy down there. So uh, we have also with us uh, Tyler Bowman. Tyler has been working closely with Gary Palmer, uh, learning some of the ropes of image processing and trying to take his imaging to the next level. Um, so how's it going, guys? Like you said, Scott, me and Gary have been talking for at least this week. He, he's like Jerry. He has a lot of vast knowledge within the astrophotography community. And it's a pleasure to actually get to speak with someone that that has that ability. And I, I bug Jerry too much anyway because of work issues. And so I figured I'd yeah. bug Gary on <laughs> photography issues. Um, but if I do have a mount question, I go straight to Jerry. So don't, don't get that. Don't <laughs> miss that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great again, to, to be able to speak to those guys and to, and to get a hold of what they know. And so I can pass it down along uh, to other individuals who need help. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a couple images. <clears throat> yeah. Let's see what's uh, <clears throat> things are progressing now. Right now you've got, you've got a G 11, uh, with the PMC-8, right? Okay. Um, and uh, which scope are you using right now? Well, with this, the, the particular image that I'm going to show here was with the 127 FCD-100. Okay. With the um, field flattener focal reducer of 0.7. So that brings my focal length of 952 to 671, 672, uh, which obviously I shot the bubble nebula with, which... I Great to get M52 in there as well in the bottom right, the bottom left hand corner. Um, Gary helped me process. I had a heck of a time to try to get this thing to stack, which I, it's got to do something with either my lights or other types of calibration frames, which uh, it, it's a process to figure that out um, in that. And this other image was Gary's as well. You've already seen tonight. If it'll pull up. This was my rendition and take on the processing. Um, he just gave me the stack version and I went with it. Um, so let's. Are we on the same image? Or are you? Uh, it should be Andromeda's Galaxy. It should be up. Still, we're still on the other one. So. Still on the bubble. Okay, hang on just a second. Entering <clears throat> stopped. Hang on. And there. How about now? Ah, that's good. <laughs> that's that's very nice. Yeah, we did see this earlier. Yes, you saw Gary's rendition, which he brought out more details, uh, which I haven't mastered Pix Insight, which that's a program that's that's daunting and a lot of information to try to gather in. But this again is my rendition of uh, this one. Um, tonight I tried to shoot with an ED80. Uh, can't let me borrow one to uh, <clears throat> try for tonight. Then the clouds rolled in. I couldn't get very much images. Um, so that's where we're at right now. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So how do you feel? I mean, uh, how, you, you're you're working with uh, a new mount. Um, uh, you're you're working with really a master at uh, image processing. Uh, What's the experience like for you? The mount is it's overwhelming at some point because it's, it's something new that I have to mess with now. Um, it's, it's my third mount total in doing this hobby altogether. I started with an AVX from Celestron. Okay. 
<clears throat> I went to an HEQ 6R Pro, which I didn't spend much time with, but I, every stream that you went on, I kept seeing that G11 sitting behind you. So you're right. the enabler <laughs> of this. Right. So, cool. So I, and I, I've always been told that the better the mount, the better the uh, the actual images will be because of the stable it is. And yeah. that's why I went with the G11 and it came with Maybe. The hey, hey, Tyler, that might work. That might be right. It could be wrong, though. You could make terrible images with the best mount in the world. True. <laughs> it's true. Um, it's making pretty good images, and uh... so it's up to your skills and knowledge, is what I would say. I wouldn't. I wouldn't put all the blame or all the uh, all the goodness on the mount's sake. I wouldn't say that at all. <laughs> true. Thank There's you. many things to learn. Um, certainly with all new equipment, there, there's a hundred things in the pot there to, to learn. So to get, um, start getting any images out of it, you, you're actually doing okay. You know, I would say the mount is, a good mount is necessary, but not sufficient. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. Um, but, you know, in the, in the processing so far, I think what we've done is... Um, probably about five hours six hours here or there just dotted around and throwing images back and a little bit of processing but that bubble's come out pretty well you know considering the um basic errors that were there you know which is part of the learning process so that is that, that is the key to all of this it really is part of the learning process and we all do it you know even even me now i could get a new product coming in and put something on and, and go for it as normal and then uh, I look at it and oh you know I forgot to do that something really basic what we call a schoolboy era um, when you've been doing it quite a long time um, but we still do the mistakes and it's not the mistake it's how you get around that mistake that's the key thing so it's working out what you can salvage out of something and I think they come out pretty well yeah um, considering they're all short amount of data they're, they really are short amount of data right and for anyone out there listening, if you're wanting to know more about uh, image processing and, you know, you've, you've uh, started working with PixInsight, uh, you could probably do no better than to take uh, uh, lessons from Gary. And um, so his website is astrocourses.co.uk. And... Um, uh, you can uh, uh, hook up with Gary and and learn a lot more, and uh, you know uh, he'll take he'll fast track you uh, through some of the more complex image processing techniques and uh, get you to the point of where you're really proud of the images that you're making. So that's great. Cool. Um, I just wanted to throw up that image quickly um, that Jerry was on about because I've actually scrapped what we processed, so I had to reprocess it while we were all talking. Um, but very quickly, that was from the Galileo telescope. The Galileo scope. <laughs> yeah, it, it did have a two thousand pound camera on it, but it's from the Galileo telescope. I love it. <laughs> I could only get alive to see this today. <laughs> that shows you the that shows you the potential of those optics. Really, is what it comes down to, right? That's yeah. right. That's I did have to use a lot of cable ties and tape to hold the camera in place, but it, it, it produced the image. That was the thing. So that's right. When we get a, a bit more time and some clear skies, we will do probably do something like Orion or something like that. That's quite a bright and easy target, and just see what we can get out of it for a bit of fun. Unbelievable. <laughs> Wait, well, says he means money, Americans. <laughs> Uh, so anyways, um, we are, uh, getting towards the end of our show. Kent has some door prize announcements to make from the last star party from, uh, global star party. Yes, I do. So I didn't write down the prizes. So Scott, you get to make up the prizes, although it tends to be the same order. Yeah, it's the uh, same order. Question number one, I didn't write the question down, but I know what the answer is. How I know that, I don't know. But uh, the question was uh, about an asteroid that's named after somebody we know, I think. Right, Jerry? Isn't that what you ask? 
Yeah, I was asking what the asteroid number was for the asteroid Scott Roberts. So Zach Kruger was I, I, the first. One. It is. Huh? I said I don't think I even know what it yeah, is. Yeah, that's really bad, Scott. That's like memorizing your phone number. Come on. So you know what mine is. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Zach Kruger came in with the first answer. Uh, one five seven seven nine. Scott Roberts. That sounds familiar. Yes, is the answer, and that's going to be a uh, fifty-two degree of choice of what we have in stock. Yep. Question number two: <clears throat> How many minor planets have been visited? Uh, we had a range of people that went in, and it was the third or fourth person that finally got the correct answer. Sarah Longcore uh, with 16, and that's probably going to be, what, an 82 degree of choice, Scott? Inch and a quarter, yes. Okay, 82 degree, inch and a quarter, right? Mm hmm Okay. And then question number three, what date does Halley's Comet pass closest to the sun? The answer was July 28th, 2061, and 100 hour Wade, Wade Prunty was the first one through the gate uh, oh. with that answer. Okay. And uh, I can't remember who it was. I meant to write this down and give them an honorable mention. Uh, they looked up the ephemeris and got the exact second uh, <laughs> of, of when it would be as well on that date. So really, okay. yeah. So, uh, you know, just because of the, you know how we all, we're all curious about minutia like that. So sure. we looked it up. Sure. <laughs> So that person's going to win a Galileo scope, Scott, or what? An AR-102. Uh, AR oh, okay. An AR-102. Not right. a Galileo scope. I may throw a Galileo scope in just for the fun <laughs> of it every once in a while. So. What, the honorable mention guy? We'll give a Galileo scope, too. I'll look him up. The, uh, I'll look that one up. That's, That's what I've got. And I guess, is it time for Terry's? Yep. Last question. Last and final question. And this will be for an Explore Scientific AR airspace doublet, uh, AR-102. Um, and we're starting to see some great astrophotography done with the AR series. Um, uh, people are doing narrowband imaging with it, uh, solar imaging with it. And so it's a, it's a great scope. It's an F6.5. Comes with a uh, two-speed focuser, cradle rings, uh, eight by fifty finder, and a star diagonal, so two-inch star diagonal. So everything you need to get started, except for a mount and an astronomer to uh, make it all work. So, right. And so, what what's the uh, final final question going to be, Terry? Before Terry asks. Yes. Do you have a scope, Terry? Me. Yeah. 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 What do you have? Observatory. Eight inch. Met cast in a 14 inch. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, the last question again, check the Facebook page in the Astronomical League. Whose well known name appears in the header of the Astronomical League's library telescope entry form? Okay, once again. Whose well known name appears in the header? of the Astronomical League's Library Telescope Entry Form. Okay, all right, so that's the question. You're gonna to wanna to send those answers to Kent at explorescientific.com. And through the miracle of the internet, we will send it over to the Astronomical League where the officers will study those answers and determine who was the first one to correctly answer that. And uh, they will notify the winner and then they'll notify us and we will send the uh, Explore Scientific AR-102 telescope to that uh, new owner. So, uh, you know, that's, that's great. And Terry, I wanna thank you again uh, for uh, participating tonight, staying up with us late at night. I know that you're a you know, dyed-in-the-wool astronomer yourself and uh, are not, uh, you know, uh, and, and stay up many long nights, sometimes doing beautiful aurora shots like what's behind you right now. So that's, that's a great shot. Where is this particular shot? You, I think you've had it up before, but uh, 
Where, where did you make this this one that's behind? Um, this is up in the Boundary Waters towards up Minnesota, right off of Lake Superior down Gunflint Flint Trail. It's beautiful. It's on the North Shore Lake Superior down Gunflint Trail. But thank you, Scott, for everything that you are doing. And I, tell, I enjoy these. It's amazing what I learned, the people. Yeah. You know, I really enjoy it. I My dog has been distracting me, wanting in and out. She knows I'm up, so she wants to go out. Uh, but beyond uh, that, I, mean, I just follow the dog around. But uh, I'm having a great time. You guys do a great job. And it's so interesting to see all this astrophotography and all of the information, the learning and the experience is just fantastic. So thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, uh, we're about ready to wrap up the show. Uh, does anyone else have anything to share? Any final comments? Jerry, we, we, never, we never put the spotlight on you. Um, yeah, that's fine. I get to get the spotlight every day with you yes, in you the do. afternoon. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> that's so it's a pleasure for me not to have to, you know, talk at least half is half the time we're on you know <laughs> right yeah but uh, i enjoy it i mean this is great it's uh it's awesome to uh interact with everybody and learn and faces and names that's the biggest thing is to see everybody's face that's that's really a i like these kind of meetings better because you can look at everybody's face at the same time oh yeah pretty much and, and instead of uh you know not seeing everybody when you're talking to them you know oh. Uh, they're hiding behind their voice or whatever. Well, and you can hear their voice too. That's so much. Yeah, I right. right. hear that sound. Yeah, and we had some. I mean, we had poetry tonight. Uh, Norman Fulham. Wow, he knocked it out of the park with that. Yep. Uh, that that was awesome rendition. I mean, that was that was great. I yeah. really enjoyed that. Um, I have an interesting thing to to say. Sure. Um, the other a few days ago. Um, you know, I told you uh, I go downtown to Fountain Hills and in the winter months we have once a month we get together for a star party and have public comes in. And um, the one guy that uh, r runs that, his name is Ted, Ted Bank, blank, I think it is, Ted Blank. Anyway, <clears throat> one day I'm, I went over to around the corner from my house to uh, where my pastor is to visit him, you know, and we're in the backyard and I'm looking out and uh, there's an observatory. And uh, this is like real close to my house. Yeah, exactly. The look on your face is what I did. Yeah. Hmm. hmm. So I go, who is this guy next door? And he goes, I don't know. I said, you haven't met the guy next door? Nope. It's okay. So I said, I'm going over there. So I went over there and knocked on the door. And who comes out but this guy from the, <laughs> from the uh, our meetings that we have. Oh. Go, you live here? And he goes, yeah. I go. Wow. And he goes, yeah, you want to see my observatory? I said, sure. He's got a 14 inch Celestron in there. Uh, it's a nice building. Um, oh, and you can, you can see my house from his observatory. <laughs> you can see my, my little observatory thing. And I said, this is incredible. You know, so we're going to do some work back and forth together. He, he actually uh, works for NASA on occasion. Oh, he takes a crew of uh, 10 people out to observe an occultation with telescopes supplied by NASA to uh, do measurements of um, asteroids. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, very yeah. interesting. Yep. He's an active guy that's doing uh, amateur work, you know, that's science, it's cool. Right, yeah, that's right. And Jerry, Jerry Hubble is always trying to get people involved in science um, you know, certainly uh, his, his first book was all about scientific imaging and uh, how to put together your, you know, uh, an imaging system, you know. And from reading the book, you know, really, uh, you can tell that um, uh, Jerry approaches it from like a critical thinking, critical strategy uh, type of exercise. And so that I found that very, very interesting. And uh, certainly, uh, I think he articulated that very, very well um, for amateur astronomers. So if you're looking to get into astronomical imaging, you definitely want to get one of his books. Um, if you Thanks, ask Scott, him, he'll sign it you. for you. <laughs> and, yeah, just email me um, if you're interested, jrh at explorescientific.com. 
right? Um, yeah, I appreciate that, Scott. That's uh, uh, that's nice to hear. Yeah, yeah. So, well, it's true. So, and Ajay, all the stuff I said about you is true. I, I highly respect you, dude. Uh, I know you're brilliant, and um, uh, you know, I also I, something I did not know about Ajay was that uh, you know he he. Um, save people's lives you were uh, uh what did you 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 were involved like um um is either in firefighting or um i'm still a volunteer with the anarchist mountain fire department up in the okanagan and i work with king county search and rescue here in seattle search and rescue that's awesome yeah, and Bob, i know that you did a lot of work with uh, law enforcement as well uh, yeah, I mean, King County Search Rescue is a division of the uh, Sheriff's Department, so. Right. Yeah. yeah. Very. I know, I know Bob Denny is also very involved with the Sheriff's Department over there in uh, Mesa. That's right. I spent 18 years as a volunteer reserve deputy with Maricopa County Sheriff, and uh, that added up to almost 15,000 hours of volunteer time. Oh. I flew with their aviation division. I was an airboat pilot, and... Um, it was quite an amazing way to have a later in life volunteer community service. And I've talked to Ajay and he's, he gets it. I mean, he, it's, it's search and rescue is tough. I never got involved in th with that. Uh, we flew the search and rescue people who were volunteers in our helicopter. And I was, uh, I went on a number of training exercises with them where we would put them out and bring them in on their on one skids and so forth on the helicopter. But those guys, I'll tell you, AJ, AJ, it's an awesome thing. And it takes a lot of training and a continuous training to be competent as search and rescue. So hats off, sir. And, and we're close by if you're in Mesa and it's been yeah. hot this year and a lot of guys go out there and rescue people that have gotten lost on the mountain. Which yep. is crazy. Yeah, those are all my friends, the, the aviation guys. That's what I did for the last five years of my reserve career. So well, we'll have to have a coffee sometime for that uh, close. Yeah. Right. <laughs> About 2,000 air hours with the sheriff's office. Wow. Uh, it's a lot so. to really respect. I, all this, uh, um, you know, this dedication to uh, other people's lives and just trying to improve people's lives in one way or another. And, um, I, I think it's amazing. So a lot of respect. My hat's off to you, Ajay. It really is. So, and you too, Bob. So oh, Definitely, Ajay. That's good stuff. <laughs> yeah. And thank you, Scott, for having me on. I'm kind of an outsider in this group, again, because I'm not an astronomer. So, <laughs> But I really appreciate you um, having me on and giving me at least a little bit of a chance to tell you what I do. I'd love to be back sometime. You can come back anytime you want. You know, you're you're one more than one of us. You you are you are uh, very much the fabric of this. So he has thanks. a radio voice, doesn't he? He's awesome. He's <laughs> awesome. Who, me? <laughs> He's got a great sound. He's got a great microphone. Yeah. Well, well, he's I an engineer. Know. He's an engineer. He knows how to make it work. Uh, Richard, <laughs> them too. Yep. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, Terry, thank you. Oh, uh, before we go, what was, what, I mean, for you guys that participated tonight, what was your favorite part of, uh, of Global Star Party uh, 7? I got to see a huge telescope. <laughs> <laughs> right? 36 inches. I probably never will see it, see it, but just to actually see it in, in a live stream was pretty phenomenal. Pretty cool. That's right. We need to probably throw a 100, 100 degree eyepiece in it just to see what we can see. Hey, Tyler, I'll have to take you to show you my, uh, my our 24 inch F 18 brochure yeah. that we have. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. It's cool to see those single shots and think in your head, hey, my scope does just about that good. But, you know, that's staring at the object for quite a while. His is just one shot. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. That's the way it works. The more money you spend, the yeah. more data you can get per unit time. Mm -hmm. I think well, my favorite was Amy Ballenbach. What a beautiful speaker she is and how she did it. I I love communication. I think well, you, you know you guys said I have a radio voice, but I really am 
<laughs> into communication, voice communication, and and but it's not just that. It's your your eyes, your face, everything. Your I talk with my hands. Anyway, mm -hmm. she was fabulous, and what she did was also very very nice. And I let her know on my on the private chat. Yeah, that's great, um, Marco Marco Pola. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, said, my favorite parts were the history of light pollution, mercury lesson, and then poetry. Uh, Jeff Wise said, Libby and all the poetry and then the music. That's cool. That's cool. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, people are chatting in and they're saying, thank you for your service, Ad Jay and Robert. Uh, and Wade Prunty wants to know, anyone in driving distance looking to buy a Celestron CGX mount and tripod with GPS, Wi-Fi, and StarSense auto align? You'll have to come on the show and, and uh, show what you got, um, Wade. You can come on tomorrow if you want to show it. Um, okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I think that's going to be a night. And, uh, you know... Uh, all of you that uh, stayed for the duration, uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, it's it's not uh, easy to be on live for, you know, hours on end, but uh, it was awesome. And I look forward to having you back at the next uh, Global Star Party, which actually happens Friday. Um, uh, it will happen during the daytime for us here in the States. Uh, so uh, we get started at 4 p.m. Central. Um, and uh, if you are watching and you want to be part of it somehow, uh, go to explorescientific.com forward slash events, buy a free ticket, uh, we'll get you uh, the credentials for the broadcast and um, we will uh, we'll have you uh, join us. So, um, and thanks again. And thanks to the Astronomical League, Clear Skies Network, Cloudy Nights Forum that broadcasts our show on their homepage, um, and uh, all of you in the audience. So thanks, and uh, as Jack Horkheimer would always say, keep looking up, and we'll see you next time. Cheers, Scott. Thank you for arranging. Take care. Thank you. Like, share, and subscribe. All the hardcores are left. Yes. <laughs>